This is Guy Martin, part-time world-famous motorbike racer and full-time lorry mechanic. He's not looking pretty. He's a man with a passion, a whopping great big passion for when Britain was the workshop of the world. Everything was coming out of Britain, everything. You know, iron bridges, steam engines, cotton manufacturer, the factory. Oh, get excited. Now Guy wants to recapture the spirit of his 19th century engineering idols with a unique challenge. Reckless. She's a bit tatty on the edges, boy. You know, we've got a bit of red lead on her. Along with his best mate Maeve, he's going to spend the next six weeks transforming this ramshackle old narrowboat into a celebration of the great British inventions of the Industrial Revolution. That is a great British invention. We should be proud of being British, and I think people need to know, don't they? Guy will learn all kinds of traditional techniques to build everything he needs to kit out his narrowboat. From his own cotton sheets to sleep on, to a steam engine to power his shower. <laughs> and along the way, he'll experience firsthand the beautiful hidden world of Britain's canal network. Oh, I'm loving this, I'm feeling it. It's all about squeezing 200 years of British brilliance into renovating one single boat. The boat that Guy built. Guy's decided that the first and most essential thing that needs installing on Reckless is tea-making facilities. Tea, tea's my thing, really. I mean, my cup that I have at work is probably two and a half times the size of a normal cup of tea. And I'd reckon, I'd reckon I was doing near on 20 a day. So if we can make a cup using old methods and make a kettle and boil the water using old methods, that's what we're going to do, and we're going to do it properly. So when you start as you mean to go on. So Guy's first mission is to build a blast furnace so he can cast his own kettle. Then he'll throw his own mugs and choose his tea the proper way. That's a great slur. Ah, <coughs> heck. But before all that, Guy's very first job is to introduce his mate Maeve to their project for the next six weeks, a narrow boat called Reckless. Well, here we are. What have you done? Reckless. What We're very think? fitting. She's moored at Worsley House near Manchester at the start of Britain's first ever man-made waterway, the Bridgewater Canal. Oh, by heck, you're a bit keen there, boss. She's 60-foot boy. What yeah. sort of year do you reckon she is? <sighs> Do you know what? I couldn't tell you. By the way she looks, has it been through a couple of world wars? That's what I'd have said, but no, 1991. 1991 with a 1931 engine. I do admire your enthusiasm, you know. Chief, it's all there. You can see the potential, though, can't you? There's even more of what Guy charmingly calls potential on the inside. Oh, we have the bare canvas, have we not? She's skinned out, then. Hey? Oh, yeah, Not yeah, a bad yeah, old yeah. job, though, is it? Luckily, Maeve is a carpenter by trade. This is where you come in. I mean, yeah, this is I'm your, just thinking. I'm getting. This is your trade. I'm happy now, aren't I? So we'll box this off, put them wires in. We can have a kitchen here. Don't you reckon? Go on, and paint the picture, boy. We like our books, don't we? Oh, we love the books. We're going to have a bookcase, <laughs> and this bookcase will hold the key to everything. Do you think it will be the oracle, <laughs> like the oracle of all things oh, narrow, oh, narrow don't, don't all get things narrowboat? Don't get deep. Well, Woodwork and craftsmanship may appeal to Maeve, but Guy gets excited by a nice lump of engineering. This is where it all takes place. We've got here, 1931, twin cylinder, overhead camshaft. Twin cylinder. No, this, <coughs> perfect for the job, makes 20 odd horsepower, but it'll make, you know, it'll do that forever and a day. Yeah. Next, it's time to head out onto the canal, and as Guy has never steered a 60-foot narrow boat before, this should be interesting. Hang on, I'll put it off. I'll go back, man. Just go back. Tell you what, boy, this is going a lot worse than I expected. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're away! A few briars. It's all under control. Bon voyage! <laughs> Traditional narrow boats like Reckless played a crucial part in transporting the fuel of the early Industrial Revolution, coal. They were the HGVs of their time, but unlike the lorries of today, whole families lived on board, sleeping in a tiny cabin at the back of the boat. Morning, boss. Morning. All right, we've only just got my legs on you, only just. <laughs> 
the thing steers from the back, so you've just got to say you're on the front over there, where you've got to do it a lot earlier. Back it off, Chief. I, I know, we're off too, too quick far. here, boy. I know, I know. We're gonna get, we're gonna get a blue light here. I've got enough points on my life. Guy's honing his skills on the Bridgewater Canal, which loops through Cheshire in northwest England. It was considered a monumental engineering feat when it was built in 1761 by a precocious 21-year-old called Francis Egerton. It transported coal from his mines to his factories. It was along the same way of thinking as me, I think. I don't like the same. Wore the this. same clothes day in, day out, yeah. a bit the same as me. Yeah. One right into washing and swore like a true. <laughs> Did he? You got the hang of steering it yet? Yeah. You're, you're a bit less wayward. I don't know, Chief. Less is more. Less is more. Less is more. Go on. I think. Look, you're uptight. You're uptight. I just am. Chill. Just I chill. Am. Just chill. You were uptight when we were getting. I know. I, I know. <laughs> we was nearly bored. <laughs> this was is amazing. what I'm getting the hang of. Good so, show. That bloke's still behind us. Look. We passed him about half hour ago. I know. We haven't gained a lot of time, have we? Hey, okay. where's the fire? having got to grips with steering reckless. Next, the boys must tackle one of the great engineering wonders of the canal age, the Anderton boat lift. I reckon you want a few less revs, boy. Built in 1875, it still carries narrow boats up and down between the Trent and Mersey Canal and the River Weaver 50 feet below. It takes a steady hand to navigate into its tight entrance not necessarily a job for a complete novice. Are you nervous? I'm not nervous, I'm just very... Apprehensive. You see, this is like coming here like a bull in a china shop. I think it's, it's a measure twice, cut once job. As Guy concentrates on manoeuvring, he forgets narrow boats don't have brakes. I'm going to bump that out. <laughs> oh. This shining example of Victorian ingenuity is made up of two huge water tanks which carry the boats. The water tanks act like a pair of perfectly balanced scales, meaning very little power is needed to move a 20-ton boat up or down. Look at the size of that. Oh, yeah. That is a piece of kit, isn't it? It's the epitome of... British engineering, isn't it? Actually, you're getting deeper again, Mavis. Oh, I'm a bit overcome by it all again. It is impressive. After negotiating the boat lift with flying colours, it's down to the business of Guy and Maeve's proper challenge. Building and manufacturing everything they need to make a cup of tea. And that challenge begins in the heart of the black country, in Dudley, at a Victorian foundry where they intend to recreate one of the most important processes of the Industrial Revolution, the production of cast iron. We've got to make a kettle. That's what we're here to do. And to make a kettle, we need some cast iron. And to cast iron, we need a furnace. A blast furnace is basically a big brick oven. Put in iron ore, rock which contains the metal iron, then get the furnace really hot and the ore breaks down, producing pure molten iron. Sounds easy, doesn't it? And I thought, yeah, it can't be, can't be rocket science, can it? But apparently it is. Apparently it's brain surgery. Or would you put brain surgery above rocket science? Would you? Would you? In fact, smelting iron is so hard, the boys wouldn't stand a chance on their own. So they've recruited archaeometallurgist Jerry McDonnell to take on the role of foreman. So we've got our man Jerry down here. He's, um, he's going to give us a bit of direction to turn iron ore into a bit of cast, just a bit like our man um, Abraham Darby. Abraham Darby, I don't know, it's 1700s, early 1700s. He started smelting iron ore for, um, on a commercial scale, like a massive scale. I mean, you've only got to look here. I mean, that's like a big steam hammer. You know, and all this stuff is really down to Abraham Darby. Darby's furnaces made iron for machinery, bridges and ships. And Guy and Maeve will make a small but accurate version of a Darby furnace. It will need to reach a temperature of over 1,000 degrees to turn this iron ore into molten metal. What we're going to do is we're going to basically build a small square shaft 
basically, out of these bricks about that high, with an opening at the front yeah. here, for which the iron hopefully will run out of. But what we must make sure is that the bricks are really nicely, tightly together, because it's got to be airtight, OK? Right. Before Abraham Darby came along, cast iron makers were facing a big problem. Towards the end of the 1600s, basically, the, the, the blast furnaces are closing down because they can't get enough charcoal fuel. And they're using charcoal because charcoal's a very clean fuel. Yes. You use it on your barbecue, yeah? yeah, yeah now, yeah. if you went home and tried to cook a barbecue with lumps of coal, your food would taste disgusting. So if you tried to go and smelt your iron with coal, which was a but plentiful, yes. you'd put sulphur into the metal, it would make it brittle, and nobody would want to use it. Right. Okay? So they tried and failed. What Darby did was invent a process for fueling furnaces with coke, essentially coal minus the impurities, so it burns cleaner and hotter. That led to better quality cast iron being produced and truly revolutionised industry. Britain could now mass produce anything from a small pot to massive factories and machinery. What do you reckon, Jerry? Well, we're about a quarter of the way up. Ah, oh, quite right. You know, once we get this in, it will move faster, yeah. yeah. Let's have it. She yeah. So, with things going well, Guy leaves Maeve and Jerry to finish building the furnace because you need more than just a kettle to make a cup of tea. He's swapping the heavy ironwork of the Industrial Revolution for a more delicate but just as important product of the same age ceramics. It's time to make a mug at the Stoke on Trent headquarters of the most famous pottery manufacturer of all. I'm at Josiah Wedgwood. Clever old boy, clever old boy. Well, the methods that he used for pottery 250 odd years ago, you know, they were that efficient. You know, they're still using that, well, those methods now. Before having a crack at making his own mugs, Guy gets a demonstration from possibly the most skilled potter in Britain. Robin's worked at Wedgwood since he was 12. And you, you just come in a couple of days a week now? Yeah. For a bit of Guinness money? Yeah. <laughs> Robin is one of only two men who can make what Josiah Wedgwood saw as his greatest creation, the Portland vase. Is he right? It took him, did it take him 5,000 goals? Just to, what, to get the right shape and... Yeah, getting okay, it fired right. Right. Robin can throw a Portland vase in just 20 minutes, and once decorated and fired, his creation will be worth £9,000. He's a bit out of my price range. <laughs> Leaving Robin to his vase, Guy moves on to start his own rather less ambitious creations, a pair of mugs. I don't know if centrifugal force will take hold and end up firing all across the room. <laughs> <laughs> and under the watchful eye of Gavin, Guy seems to pick up the art of throwing rather quickly. I'm sure yeah. you haven't done this before? No, 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 no never. There's some more water on. All right. Water. Water, well, yeah, it's from Lincolnshire, you see. Oh, I see. Well, you see, W-A-T-E-R, it's spelled water. Oh. <laughs> no, it's looking very nice. You think? Yeah. Pop it down. All right for a first attempt? Absolutely brilliant. Yeah? Yeah. I tap very much. Very good fun. So, on to the second mug, and Guy seems to be getting a bit overconfident. Oh, I'm making a pig's ear of it. Now, come down with your thumbs on the top. But with an expert tip, he manages to rescue it. It's getting good height on there, even your rim. What do you reckon, Gavin? Yeah? yeah, definitely. We've got a bit more girth on, though. Before any decoration can be added to Guy's mugs, they need to dry out for two days. So Guy takes a tour to see what else goes into making this iconic pottery. Yeah, it's not bad. Well, yeah. we're getting there, aren't we? We're getting there now, yeah. You yeah, all right, Sue? I'm fine, thank you. Suzanne Heathcote's been working at the factory for over 30 years. She's an expert at creating the intricate decorations that have made Wedgwood pottery world famous. It's a job Guy soon finds out is harder than it looks. Oh, <laughs> oh wait, we've knackered the job. Getting workers to specialise in just one part of the process was an idea first introduced by Wedgwood. We've brought it. Oh he essentially invented the production line, which made his factories more efficient and his products a higher quality. No, oh, we've written that. Too much pressure, was it? There isn't many people that can do it. I've not, as you've seen, yeah. <laughs> That's it. Turn it over now, take it off the waddler for you. There you go. Hallelujah. <laughs> Wedgwood really did demand very high standards. 
he had a habit of smashing any pot with his walking stick that he didn't think was up to scratch. Look, I've got a sweat on. <laughs> but it looks like the ones guys decorated will make the grade. Well, thank you very much. Welcome. Cheers, boss. All that effort, and in Wedgwood's day, there was still a chance that the workers would go home unpaid. Everything came down to the process of baking the pottery in the kiln. The kiln was more or less the last operation. You know, there was a 101 things that could go wrong, and, and the person that threw the clay, that put the decorative bits on there, they got paid on the work that came out of the kiln. But if the fellow that was running the kiln didn't do a very good job, you know, no one would get paid. So that's a lot of weight on your shoulders, isn't it? I definitely, definitely, definitely wouldn't want that job. Spot on, boss. How long are they in there for, then? 30 hours. Let's get a brew on, then. How about? <laughs> Guy will have to wait a couple of days to see how his mugs turn out, so he heads back to the foundry where Maeve and Jerry have finished the furnace. It's ready to be topped up with purified coal known as coke, which will hopefully help produce enough molten iron to cast a kettle. Morning, boss. She's looking well. Yeah, isn't she? What do you reckon? Oh, yeah. That's what, that's what hard work does. Yeah, but I tell you what. What do you reckon? See if I'm impressed, I'm in awe. In awe? How very fitting. Yeah. So, Jerry, what do you reckon? Is she going to work? Yeah, yeah, no, really pleased because we, we managed to get a good fire in her last night that's burnt all night, so right. she's really hot. Oh, yeah, I'm going to yeah, get in the sun tan off that. <sighs> hey? I'm losing what weight. What? So, what, are we exa what exactly are we expecting? We, expect we get coke right up to the top, <laughs> and once it's a flame and on fire all oh, the way up right... to the top, then we start adding the ore and the, and the coke, and that right. basically starts to go down. So, we keep adding more ore and coke, and that's going down. And all the magic that happens in the furnace is happening basically in that zone there. Right, yeah. And what will run out of there, hopefully about three or four o'clock this afternoon, will be a stream or a run of molten iron. Molten iron? Enough to make us kettle? Well, I need to talk to you about that, because we're not going to... We can't <laughs> make... You're not letting the a side down, A kettle's too complicated. And also, in Abraham Darby's time, they didn't have kettles. Is that so right? they had just basically a, a, a little cauldron-y type thing, so a bowl, basically. Right, to heat and on it, what? To, you, you just hang that over, over a fire. Over a fire, right. So, having abandoned the idea of a kettle, the boys will now be aiming to cast a replica of an original Derby pot. But if they stand any chance of producing molten iron, they have to get the temperature in the furnace right up by blasting air into it. In Derby's day, this would have been done with a set of bellows. The boys are going to use an electric pump instead. All right. Yeah, what's what's, what's the temperature now, then? See what the temperature's doing? Look at that, straight away. Straight away. Well, I told you, didn't I? Look at it go. It was just creeping up sort of a degree at a look time. At now, now, look at it going. It was going like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 at a time. I tell you what, boy. It's like the clappers. The listen, dog, listen to it. The dog has seen the rabbit. <laughs> that is wham. So, Jerry, yeah. we're knocking on nicely now, boss. Yeah. 930, it's climbing steady. Excellent. Do you want some more coal on? Yeah, but wait, wait, wait. You, you must put on some safety because ah, that's... that's read, boys, no, no, read. that is too hot because if, if you read the, the history books, it's littered with blokes who end up in hospital. So get your, some eye protection on for right. certain. I'll see where you're coming from, boss. I'll see where you're coming from. With the furnace now loaded with coke right to the top, it's finally time to start feeding the iron ore in. So what we've got to add in, each time, we're going to add in one kilo of ore. So that is just a kilo of ore there. So we're doing that now? In a minute. And that is four kilos of coke. So we need half a bucket to one of these. Right, two to one. Now, this is where things start to get technical. They say smelting iron is as delicate as making a souffle. Oh, look at your butter fingers. <laughs> to create the right conditions is absolutely crucial to get the right ratio of coke and ore, while making sure the temperature in the furnace is kept high enough. It's a bit like a big cauldron, isn't it? Oh, I like this, boy. I like it. Any mistakes and the iron will be useless. When we start to add the iron ore, we're actually adding oxygen because there's oxygen trapped in the ore, so the flame yeah. might change colour a yeah, bit. So you've got to keep it blue. With Maeve and Jerry keeping the furnace topped up with coke and ore, Guy still needs to sort the final element of his cup of tea, the tea itself. For a man who, by his own admission, drinks 20 cups a day, this is a very serious part of the process for him. Right, we're going to go and meet Jane and James. James? Fellow northerner, so he's speaking the same sort of lingo. Third generation tea importer. He's going to show me a bit of tea tasting. And Jane knows every last thing there is to know about tea. So I'm going to come away a bit wiser, I think. And he's also going to come away with some tea to drink on Reckless. Now, Jane. Hi, guys. Great, right, James. Hi, guys. Right, we're getting there with uh, all the other implements. 
we need to get cracking with the most important thing, the tea job. So where do we start? And we're actually going to start with a, a, a tea from India called Darjeeling. OK, I'll soup be just using spoon. soup spoons. Right. Then get it underneath your tongue, cos that's where most of your sensitive taste buds are. <laughs> so it's... <laughs> like that. Right. What do you okay. reckon? Slurp. Yeah. It's like his first pint. And I said, it's a very harsh mm. sort of bottom to it. A slightly bitter. Yeah. Dri maybe yeah. drying. Yeah, sort of, dry, mm. sort of dries mm. your, my, your mouth out a little bit. Mm. But there's a softness to the top of it. There's this, there's this lovely, almost grapey sort of taste. They actually call this the champagne of teas. The champagne of yes. teas. So, Jim, this tea tasting cap has been going on since we've been importing tea. Yes, we started bringing tea in from China in the late 1650s. Yeah. And it was sold by brokers. They gradually developed this, this uh, business of, of brewing comparatively with bowls and cups and then slurping it um, so that they knew exactly what the tea was worth and what they could charge for it. But back in those oh, days, when, yeah. we, when we imported tea from China, the first teas were so expensive that it was only drunk by royalty and aristocrats. It so... was, you know, you and I would not have been drinking tea in those days. So the servant's only job was just to arrange the furniture mm -hmm. and bring all the bits and bobs that you needed. But then the lady of the house took charge of the tea and the tea was stored in the room where you were going to drink it. Because it was so expensive that if you left it in the kitchen, Cheers. there was a pretty good chance your servants would start pilfering it for Is themselves. That... Just ready to tip this one. So what's the next brew we're having then? Uh, we're having some green tea next. Green tea? Yeah, it's called gunpowder. Gunpowder? Yeah. Each leaf is hand rolled into a little pellet. Each one of those is done by it's hand. One, yeah. And when the sailors were offloading the chests of tea in the London docks, it said that they thought it was lead shot and they refused to handle the chest because they thought it might explode. That was so that seaweed, doesn't it? Told you. Hey? Told you. Yeah. Was that a proper slip? Yeah. I've, I've got, got a lot to learn. Many times. <laughs> I've got a lot to learn. A bit strong for Guy, that one, especially as he's looking for a good solid tea break tea. Well, this is a tea nice from Sri Lanka, then. It is, yes. And it was during the Industrial Revolution that the workers' tea break came about. You found that some employers who were kind hearted and benevolent actually thought, oh, my workers could do with a cup of tea as well. Yeah. So they would actually provide the tea and a room where they could drink it, and that was the beginning of the tea break. Mm -hmm. Amid copious slurping all round, Guy's search for the perfect tea break tea continues. That's a great slurp. If ever, you know, if ever the bottom falls out of biking, just come do you think? Give, give me a ring. But a yeah. tea slurping. <laughs> and it appears tea can do much more than just wet your whistle. One of the first tea merchants in Britain, Thomas Garraway, published a broadsheet about the health benefits of tea. He said it was good for your stomach, if you had stomach disorders, if you had skin problems, scurvy. No, all they don't. Oh, I scurvy. I'm always, <laughs> yeah, always call it scurvy. <laughs> um, now, we now know, having conducted 25, 30 years of research, that if you drink plenty of tea, it can actually keep Alzheimer's at Is that right? And that's to do with memory. Oh, my word, I shall be... I have memory like an elephant. This is the blended tea. Blend... Now, go on. Right. <laughs> Like Hannibal, <laughs> like Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, I'm it's honest. got a bit more about it. You know, it's a bit more off about it. And I think, well, I sat down and yeah. to chill out. That's a bit of me. Yeah. With blended tea in his pocket, Guy heads back to the foundry. The furnace is getting ever closer to producing liquid metal. But for that liquid metal to be turned into a cooking pot, there's one last process they need to master with the help of self taught expert Colin Peck. Hello, Jerry. Nice to see you, mate. Right. Green sand casting. Green sand means damp sand. When you compact it, you can form it into any shape you want. The inside of Guy and Maeve's boiling pot, for example. What do we got? A little bit firmer than that. Work your ways into your corners. Green sand casting was another British invention, patented by that man Abraham Darby at the start of the 1700s. Green sand was cheap and you could use it over and over again. And with it, large-scale production of cast iron objects like bridges, steam engines, and even girders to build factories and aqueducts began. Give a little <laughs> more effort than that. The boys make the green sand mould for their pot in four separate sections. OK, that'll do us nicely. Where to now? But one slip as they put the sections together, and the mould will be wrecked. Uh, no messing. Once the parts are all joined, they leave a pot-shaped gap between them, into which the boys will hopefully pour their molten iron. Well done, well well done you. Did it. Well done you. But it won't be until they break the mould apart at the end that they'll discover if what they've made is good enough. After days of work, 
it's time to break open the clay seal at the base of the furnace. As Guy stands ready to release the liquid iron, Colin moves into place with a red-hot crucible heated in his own mobile furnace, ready to catch the boy's precious metal. She put up a fire driver. She's coming, she's coming. Success! They've made molten iron. Or have they? Scoop it in. It quickly becomes clear that there's a problem. The metal isn't liquid enough to flow properly. Not hot enough. And there's a doubt about how much is actually metal and how much is just the molten impurities called slag. It's time to act fast. Colin reheats the mix in his portable furnace and adds a healthy dose of scrap metal to make absolutely sure there's enough molten iron produced to fill the mould. We're getting close to temperature here now, so I'm going to need the mould down there. Finally, Colin lifts the iron from his furnace and having scooped off the slag that's risen to the surface, it's over to Guy. Right, pour away. Get in that hole. Other, well, yeah, right. go you got to go out of the spout, go guy. This time, the molten iron looks perfect, but there's still a chance it could all go wrong. That will cool over the next 12. No, 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 no. It's still molten in there. You could have just let it come out the sides. All they can do is wait for the metal to cool to see if disturbing the securing weights has ruined the mould and whether Jerry's iron has done the job. If it hasn't, two days' graft will have been wasted. Dump the sand out of it. The sand is removed right. and success. Want to see your pot, guys? Yeah. All right, there you right. go, look, a complete pot, it's all there. That's yeah. quite splendid, don't you reckon? Well done, Bob. Hey? You can't, you very much. can't do it without them chaps. Right, we've earned ourselves a brew, I reckon. <sighs> Gasping. Back aboard Reckless, the boys put their new pot on the fire and then open their newly delivered Wedgwood-ish mugs. Thank you very much, yeah. Is that a reflection of me? <laughs> what do you reckon? Small and broken. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang on, why is yours bigger than mine? Well, I thought Meb was a bit short and stumpy. Right, boy, let's have a brew. I'm going to want two or three cups of tea, aren't I? <laughs> to your one. What kind of mix is that? Come on, let's get the kettle on. James the tea guru probably didn't have this brewing technique in mind for his posh blend. See, if that's looking a little bit... I don't know what the word is. It looks like a cauldron of witch's brew. <laughs> Are you ready? Go on, go on. Yeah. That's, looking bit... off, isn't it? <laughs> that's looking a bit... That's looking a bit black. <laughs> Are we clinking before or after, do you think? I reckon clink before, cos it might be the last clink we ever have. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, young man. Cheers, brother. And thanks for the cup. <laughs> or is. Up. Chief, I've had worse. That's not bad at all, really. At all. But um, I'm a little bit gobsmacked. Cheers. Tell you what, Chief, it's all come together. Mm. The pot, the tea, the cups. The cup maker especially, I think. Me and thee, on a boat, in a canal, <sighs> celebrating what's the finest and best of British. Without a Cheers. doubt. Cheers. Good work, young man. The mission continues when Guy and Maeve turn their attention to the bathroom and they try to harness the power of a steam engine to make a shower. Get in the shower! It cannot end well. You have it! <laughs> this is Guy Martin, part-time world-famous motorcycle racer and full-time lorry mechanic. He's not looking pretty. He's passionate about engineering and along with his best mate Maeve... Whee! Wish my legs were a bit longer. ..is paying tribute to his heroes of the Industrial Revolution by using some great British inventions to fit out Reckless. Look at that. A 60-foot narrow boat. We should be proud of being British. And you know, I think people need to know, don't they? They're touring Britain's beautiful canals and have already built their own blast furnace to cast a pot. Job on. Aye. We've earned ourselves a brew, I reckon. Gasping. And made their own Wedgwood pottery for the perfect old school cup of tea. Yeah. Cheers, young man. Cheers, brother. This week, the mission is to make a steam engine power a shower. Well, tea, Vicar. And it all gets rather out of hand. <laughs> Guy is squeezing 200 years of British brilliance into one boat. The boat that Guy built.
All right, Chief. How's it going? Oh, yeah, right. she's a bit moist, boss, a bit moist. We're not made of sugar, though. Guy and Maeve are pressing on in torrential rain to a crucial location in the story of the Industrial Revolution, the so-called first manufacturing town in the world, and what was once the banging, clattering, pulsating hub of Britain's canal network, Birmingham. Race, you said. <laughs> Our novice narrowboaters arrive amidst several bumps and scrapes in what was once known as the City of a Thousand Trades. Believe this or believe it not, in the Industrial Revolution, Birmingham had 174 miles of canals. Uh, yeah, I can believe it. And I'll tell you More what. than Venice, boy. Yeah. More than Venice. I can believe it, and I reckon we've hit every corner on the way round. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. We only hit nice ones as well. Birmingham was the original workshop of the world, so is a fitting place to carry out the next stage of Reckless's transformation. It's time to install a bathroom and construct a shower that is a tribute to a lifestyle phenomenon the Victorians were obsessed with, keeping clean. Perhaps not natural territory for Guy. He's filthy. Don't wash. Jumps in the bath will be an oil slick. But building a bathroom allows Guy to pay tribute to a little-known British invention, Benjamin Maughan's geezer, the first ever instantaneous water heater. He was only a pair and decorator, but, you know, he, had, he, knew, his, he knew his onions. Don't knock it, Chief. Say. Practical man. Oh, pra definitely a practical man. He came out with his contraption boy. Go on. The water geezer. Bathing was a great Victorian fashion. But waiting for the naked flames under your cast iron bath to heat the water could take half an hour. So we thought, rather than time warm this massive amount of water up in one go, why not warm a little bit up fast? And then we'll end up with a lot of water warm a lot faster. Did right. You get that? Did that make sense? It did. A lot it did. of water warm. No, I've got a lot you. Faster. Morn's idea was to use a gas flame. Watch your eyebrows. Ooh. To heat metal coils. Gentle, gentle. Oh, gentle. you know what I'm like. Like a bull in a china shop, man. It's got a practical experiment. Look at that. Then pour cold water over the top of them. That's a rare colour. Yeah, it's not the prettiest looking. I tell you what, Chief, that, <laughs> that does look like your bath water. Yeah, hang on. Woohoo! We're not talking minutes. This is going to happen in seconds. We're going to get a bit of water out there. You heard the sizzling going on. Oh, right. my word. By the time the water's fallen out of the spout at the bottom, it should be instantly hot. Chief, chief, feel that. No, chief. no, 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 no. Chief, feel, feel that, honestly. I don't. Look at that. Hey? Well, this was like a, a oh, party trick. That's, I know. Not, that's hot enough for the cup of tea with. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of seconds, boy. We won't be long filling the bath there, will we? No. That, that is, is a great British invention. So could the geezer provide the perfect shower for Reckless? Probably not. The geezer had a fiery problem when it was used in a confined area. And to find out what, Guy and Maeve need a very big field. Hey, up, Chief. Guy, I'm down. You what? Think of this shed as the confines of Reckless's bathroom. I'll do it. Yeah. The geezer used natural gas, but unfortunately, there was no exhaust incorporated into its design. In a small bathroom, that meant the gas could build up to dangerous levels, making for a potentially explosive cocktail. To see what would happen if they used this old-fashioned gas-powered heater on their beloved boat, the boys have called in some special effects experts to fill the shed with gas. Hey, let's have an explosion. <laughs> I don't know, you're a bit nervous. No, I'm out. A little bit, Chief. Why? That ain't going to work. There's another one. Whoa! That'd have hurt. <laughs> That'd have upset next door, <laughs> I think. <laughs> oh, dear yeah. me. I don't think that's going to go down very well on the canal boat, though. No. We're going to need a safer shower, boss. We are, Chief. We are. Guy's plan B takes him into the city and what will hopefully be a less dangerous way of building a shower. 
Birmingham was home to some of the great engineering minds of the Industrial Revolution, and two stand out amongst the rest. By 1800, 500 of their machines were in action across the country. They were the steam engine pioneers. James Watt and Matthew Bolton. James Watt being the brains behind the operation and Matthew Bolton being the, um, the driving force, the, uh, the salesman. It's proper that they put it here, innit, and put it on a roundabout. Every man and the dog's driving past. No one's looking at it, are they? No one's bothering with it. They don't get it, do they? I don't think they should. I mean, what year is this? I'll have a look. I'll have a look. It, says, it says the year on here, doesn't it? I'll have a look. 18 something or other. 1817. That's a week or two ago, that, innit? You know, we've got the piston area there and we've got the boiler over there. But then we've got, look. Yes, look here. Look, Craig is a waste of a man. Shannon J. It's just graffiti. What are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah, well, I wouldn't. It's not right, is it? Hey? Maybe these are young people and they don't get it. So hopefully you can get it across to the masses of, um, you know, what England was and what they did. We've done a lot, haven't we? We have. But no one gets it, do they? No one gets it. No one gets it. Watt was a superstar of his time, said to be a benefactor of the world. People even kept miniature statues of him in their homes. James Watt is the boy, really. You know, and the local college, local to James Watt, gave him this steam engine because it had broken down. He stripped it down and had this, their engine in bits, this steam engine in bits. And he thought, oh, I can do something a bit better than that. And he came up with his own contraption, this new condensing system, put it on, 75% more efficient. People have graffitied it. Show some respect, eh? All right, boss. How's it going, mate? What do you reckon to that machine? It's beautiful. Beautiful? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, it is. Yeah? You walk yeah. past it every day? Yeah, I do. Do you know what it was? No, I don't. Watton Bolton steam pump. Oh, OK. Do you want to knock it down or something? No, 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 no. Because I've just been looking around it and there's people that's like graffitied it and stuff yeah. like that. And I just oh, think, okay. well, I think it's disgusting, really. It is. But you get it, though? You get yeah, the machine? Yeah, I, I do get the machine. Good man. I'm pleased you appreciate it. Right. Thank you so much. No worries, boss. Thank you. Right. <laughs> he gets it. It's not rocket science. I mean, it looks it, doesn't it? We can use this principle to power me shower. One of the most important things steam engines drove were water pumps for lock systems. Locks basically let a narrowboat go up or down a hill by raising or lowering the boat to a different water level. But every time you use one, some water is lost from the upper part of the canal. To stop it drying out, pumps were used to replenish the water. Guy will use a similar solution, except his pump will send water to the top of his shower, not a canal. Back at Reckless, Maeve has solved another part of the bathroom puzzle. So, I have sourced how to get hot water to the shower, and this is how it works. Brilliant, this. Brilliant. Quite excited. This is called a header tank. Real simple, this. Cold water in, cold water out. That'll be mounted up there. Obviously, gravity fed into the back of that. The water will be heated in a compartment at the back of the stove, which is then connected to a circuit of pipes so the water can flow through to the shower. Victorian engineers would be proud of its simplicity. It's just logical thinking, and that's what they were good at. Logical thinking. Go on, Andy. Turn that for us. All that needs to be added to Maeve's network of shower pipes is Guy's idea of a steam-powered pump. So 235 years after Watt and Bolton made steam engines in Birmingham, the boys do the same thing. Oh, look at that! Hey, check her out, boss. Assuming they can assemble it correctly, this water-functioning miniature steam engine will pump water through their shower. There's an hour or two's work on there, but we'll get to the bottom on it. Steam engines accelerated the Industrial Revolution for a simple reason. She's coming on, she's coming on all right. Because a lot of the wood in the country was being used for shipbuilding, demand for coal as a fuel rocketed. In order to get to more coal, to cope with demand, basically, we're going in deeper, much, yes. much deeper underground. Yes. So oh when you do word. that, you hit like the watercourses. So then we need something half decent to pump the water out. Along comes your steam engine. 
Ah, this... using them now to yeah. drain the mines, to get in further. So, if that didn't happen, basically, the whole industrial revolution would have just come crashing down ground to a halt. Wow. It stopped. I don't think it got going. Really? <laughs> really? Whack. Hang on, I'm going wrong with this. I'm building this wrong here. I'm... I can't multitask, Chief. Weather's used to man the base. A sudden downpour means the boys have to complete the building inside. But the engine's soon ready to test. Yeah, fill it to the brim, boss. Don't be shy. The model burns gas rather than coal. Oh, more tea, Vicar. That'll do you. That'll do you. To heat water in the boiler. Tell us what. Yeah, that'll do you well there. As long as she's out for, she's got enough in it. Right. We'll have a lit then, shall we, Chief? Go on, drive. Ooh, more tea, Vicar. Once enough steam pressure is built up. Oh, it's climbing. Simply open the valve to let the steam drive the pistons. Look at that. Look at that. Now she's revving on. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> more tea, Vicar. More tea, Vicar. Check her out. I am actually genuinely impressed, Jake. What, with me or with Mr Watt? Mr Watt, really. Yeah, yeah. If the steam engine can now spin a small pump, then the boys should be able to send water to the shower. Yeah, that'll do, won't it? Chief, there's our water pump. Brilliant, eh? Oh, yeah. Peachy. One step further to the power shower, I think. You can't, of course, have a shower without soap. And early soaps required one main ingredient, animal fat. To get some, Guy visits Bromsgrove and a fifth-generation butcher whose family have been at this since the 19th century, Andrew Partridge. Lift. Got him? Hey, oh. going back on the hook. <laughs> you manage? Right, where are we going? OK, drop him straight on the And just drop it straight on? Yeah. There it is. What's your arm? Like that. All right. Oh, yeah. That's fair. I don't know where that was. Yeah. Pretty, pretty strong, actually. Stronger than you look. So, basically, we're going to cut here, OK? Keep your hand out of the way. Go on. We're going to cut in through here. Yeah. We don't want to go into the meat, cos that's the top side there. We don't want to cut into the top side. Right. So, basically, I'll start you off, and then you're going to go straight across there now. Just keep go pulling on. away. Keep your hand out of the way. Go on, I'm and excited. don't stab the cameraman, will you? <laughs> All right? Oh, that's like yeah, a nice through bottle, that. Much out right. when it shoots out the other end. All right, at that angle. All right, yeah, that's great. Look at that. There you go. Right. I reckon we'll have a job getting soap out of that. Hey. During the Industrial Revolution, mechanisation in butchery helped increase the variety and quantity of meat on sale massively. You could sell them then. Guy couldn't resist seeing if he was cut out to be a member of this proud trade with a trial customer. Here I love. Hello. How's it going? Can I, can I have hey, come on, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. We've been here 130 years. I know, I don't want to ruin your right, reputation. Well. I'm sorry. Hello, madam, what would you like today? <laughs> Something right. like that, that'd be good, you right. know? Right. So let's start again, let's start again. <laughs> okay. 130 years. All right, well, there we're not. Hello, madam, what can I do for you? Hello, can I have two slices of belly draft, please? Not a problem, madam. Okay, let's have a go at it. Okay. Two, two slices of what? Belly draft. Two slices of belly draft. Belly, belly, belly what? Draft. Belly, belly draft. draft. Yeah? Belly draft. So right. it's your, your belly of pork, basically. Go on. So I'll cut the first one. Go on. The lady's waiting. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So make sure, hang on. I'm going to go down the rib. Okay, cook nice and hard. That's it. That's it. That's good. Okay, now right, put those on. onto the bag of proper scales. Press belly draft button. Belly draft. And ask the customer is 286 okay? Is 286 okay, man? Okay, Press no the print button. Wrap it up in that plastic. I'm not designed for this. Uh, sorry, madam. <laughs> you know what I'm showing, madam? Look at that. There, there you go, go, madam. Thank you. Thank you very much for your customer. Thank you. I'm not designed to be a butcher, I don't think. <laughs> Back at Reckless, Maeve shower plumbing is coming along nicely, and Sally Pointer has arrived. Oh, no, the time off and all. An archaeologist by trade, she's also something of an expert in making soap. She's going to help Guy turn his animal fat into an essential showering accessory. Well, we're going to be making a soap recipe today from 1865. 1865. Uh, eventually, yeah. it's going to be quite a luxurious soap, but we've oh, got to do right. the we've got to do the nitty gritty bit stuff first. Oh, I'm not worried about that. Getting yeah. mucky. That's my so, speciality. But, you'll yeah. be very clean by the end of it. Your hands will be the cleanest they've been all week. First of all, the fat needs to be chopped. Possibly a bit more. Oh, all oh, right. Oh, yeah, oh, so oh, I'm, I'm going to work it hard today. No, there's no worries there. We're not <laughs> we're not shy of grafting this camp. 
then rendered by slowly boiling it. Soap isn't always a pleasant process. And at some points in history, people complain terribly about living near soap works because living it smells so bad. Right. Is that right? Now, if you're popping past in about six hours, we've got some soap on the go, boss. All right. If you fancy soap. <laughs> Not saying you're muckier out. <laughs> the fat is then scooped out. Get the money's worth. Grape in the barrel. And a precise amount of highly corrosive caustic soda is added. Never expected soap making to be dangerous in the slices. The chemical reaction that takes place creates soap. It's a delicate chemistry lesson. Get the ratios wrong and the soap will either be too dry or too greasy. This old recipe uses grated olive oil-based soap to add some much-needed luxury to the basic ingredients. How very Victorian. The Victorian upper and middle class has had some very stuck-up ideas about cleanliness. <laughs> they got it into their heads that they were the first people to really invent cleanliness. Cleanliness and decency. And they actually, cleanliness did, and decency. they actually did social experiments where they'd put a bathroom into a workhouse and stand back to see whether the poor would use the bathrooms. What? Instead of what? Instead of not bothering. Oh. And then they professed to be surprised. They thought, this, yeah, this was amazing, that the poor would like to be, to be washed. <laughs> and, of course, people did. People liked to be clean, given hey. the, the choice. Oh, yeah, the first signs of snobbery, eh? The real soap to be seen with was invented by a man called Andrew Pears. 1789 was the year. Um, Andrew Pears came out with his, well, first brand of, of soap, Pears Soap. Yeah, he wasn't bad at the old advertising job, was he? I am 50 today, but thanks to Pear's soap, my complexion is only 17. Well, I don't know, that's not, maybe not that much good a picture, is it? But maybe it looks like the bottom of my boots, maybe. I don't know. Oh, but like my mother said, if you haven't got anything nice to say, don't say it at all. So, yeah, Andrew Pear's good man. Guy's soap mix is now ready for the finishing touch. He gets to choose his scent. Well, I think to try and make it feel at home, you know, like the sort of hand wash you'd have in a garage? What about sandalwood? That's what I was just so that's thinking. Back. Oh, that's it, nice. we're sorted. Yeah, that's the recipe that. there, perfect. Um, oh, you think another one? Try that. What's bergamot? It's a flower. You know Earl Grey tea? They put bergamot oh, in that. That's never. where the smell comes from that. I think we've got it. Yeah, does that smell good? Ooh. A final stir. You might not be fighting them off, Sal. I hesitate to say. <laughs> <laughs> let's wait till you've been through that shower yeah, first, shall we? Yeah, let's see, yeah, let's see, yeah. <laughs> And the soap mix is ready to be poured into moulds. It's almost a bit different to be doing this. It's not, you know, it's not spanners and it's not hammers. I'm getting a bit of job satisfaction out of uh, making a bit of soap. Lifetime supply for you, isn't it? A lifetime supply of me, without a doubt. <laughs> that is a lifetime supply of soap for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you very much. I wasn't even a joke. Was <laughs> it? I'm a lifetime supply of soap. <laughs> All that has to be done now is to leave Guy's unusual garage cleaner and Earl Grey soap to set overnight. While chemistry takes its course, it's time to find the finishing touch for his shower, the shower head itself. And there really is only one place you can go for bathroom fittings with a Victorian heritage. Contrary to popular belief, our mate Thomas Crapper, he didn't invent the loo. Had to do with him, John Arrington, that's who invented the loo. He was the man. Saucy godson of the Queen, so they reckon. I mean, I don't know what that means. I think maybe he was a bit of a boy. No, 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 um, Thomas Crapper, he invented a toiletware showroom. And over 100 years ago, it didn't go down too well with the, you know, the posh women of the day. They'd be jaunting on down the street in their fancy hats and, you know, anyway, they'd be seeing these Thomas Crapper showroom having all this Fancy losing all that in there, and yeah, they didn't, it didn't go down too well with them. You know, there was nearly fainting the old girls was. Yeah, it just was not the thing of the day, really, to be going down the road and seeing loos on display. Today, the company's owned by loo enthusiast Simon Kirby. Oh, my word. Now I'm impressed. What? And this is your office? Yes. Oh, heck. Look, this is incredible. Have you got any amateur shanks? Simon knows better than most that Crapper was a prolific inventor. What was very popular at the turn of the century was a sprung loo seat. Thomas Crapper invented this. The sprung loo seat? Spring-loaded loo seat. Go on. The only problem with the sprung-loaded loo seat was uh, that the buffers underneath the seat were made of India rubber, old-fashioned India rubber. Right. Awesome. And over a period of time, they'd perish and get a bit sticky. Mm -hmm. And sometimes 
when you, the incumbent <laughs> left the seat, the seat would momentarily stick to the pan, <laughs> free itself, and the <laughs> and user would only be halfway <laughs> up. And it was consequently known as the bottom slapper. <laughs> the bottom slapper. And it was not a commercial success. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Health was becoming increasingly important during the late 19th century, and fitting out a bathroom was taken very seriously. What about all these little models and that? What's, what's the crap with those? I, I love them. They're salesman samples. These are um, exact... Salesman samples? Yeah. If you were interested in sanitary wear for your house, your architect or designer would call someone from Crappers or Daltons, and they would come round with a Gladstone bag with a few of these in, and you would have to try and choose your sanitary wear from these. <laughs> Here's a special one, Guy. This is, this is one of the larger salesman samples, but think of the details in that. Look at the work that's gone into that. Hey? They're so detailed that some of these loos will flush. If you hook them up to a small supply of water, they'll actually, you know, flush properly. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey look at that. I feel honoured. <laughs> <laughs> the pinnacle of sanitary interest came in 1884, when London hosted the International Health Exhibition, to an incredible four million visitors. It was a big, important exhibition. Most of the sanitary wear manufacturers were there, and George Jennings had their latest loo on their stand. Right. They had it plumbed in, and they were sort of chucking all kinds of things into the pan and, and flushing away, demonstrating how well it worked. Right. But what was never tried was a flush off between rival loos. Until now. Right, Mev. We've got a bit of a fair test job going on here. <laughs> Guy and Maeve are going to find out if the Jennings pedestal vase really was the king of loos. Right, right, come on. Five apples. Each of the lavatories will be loaded up with the same contents used in 1884, right down to the paper. Stick them to the wet sides of the bowl, above the water. They don't really and... feel right doing <laughs> that, <laughs> do they? <laughs> Go on. As well as the Jennings, there's a pan made by Sir Henry Dalton, who was so proud of the brown glazed used on his revolutionary drains that he made a special edition. There's a crapper, a couple of French designs, and one of only two remaining Birmingham-made dolphin toilets in the world. That's not a dolphin. Well, no, he's a dolphin, <laughs> you know. That's what uh, dolphins look like in the 18th century. I was thinking a flipper. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't look much like a flipper, does it? No, it doesn't, no. Right, lads, let's get cracking. Two chains apiece, one strong pull. One, two, three. Have a go. <laughs> hey, up, Chief. Most impressive. Hey, up. What did ah. I well, well, I tell there you. We are. And what did I tell you? Dolphin, to... dolphin, you saw that? Yeah, yeah. that was no, cleared. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, results time it is then. <laughs> dolphin, this is the business. We've ended up with a sponge left, so that's it's no a bit, good. Bit crude, this one. Now, what we've got here, this is a crapper. The model's called the Kensington. Right, Crapper Kensington. Well, he's done the business, has he not? This is truly efficacious. Yeah, efficacious. Is that oh, that is, that's truly it just, efficacious. It just, yeah, yeah. This French one's pathetic. <laughs> the French one's pathetic. <laughs> well, they're pretty, though. We've got two spuds left. You yep. see? So that's used to man the beast. Used to man the beast. <laughs> and here we've got what was meant to be the benchmark. Just look The Jennings that, pedestal vase. This is a winner. We've only got one oh. sponge. Oh, I'll tell you what, I'll have to eat my words. Sorry, gentlemen. Yeah. There you go, see? Stuck in the U-Man well, sponge. Oh, I think we've two clear winners there. We've our dolphin friend and yep. this fella here. That's it. The Kensington and the dolphin. Yeah. And the Both Kensington a is a crapper, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. British. Ah, yeah. <laughs> With their toilet tribute reassuring the boys that British designs have always led the way, they head back to Reckless with a large white present from Simon, plus the crucial shower head, so they can find out if their steam-powered shower works. No, 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 don't give it too much welly, this isn't a lorry axle. Right, boss, you took that sold on. The final task is to fit a larger pump, just in case the shower needs a boost. Chief, I reckon the back is broken. Right. I reckon a celebratory sip. Well, you had a bit of supping on there, boy. A bit of gulping. <laughs> It's the moment of truth. Will this crackpot idea succeed, or have days of effort been wasted? It doesn't bear thinking about. Maeve tops the system up with water. Yeah, it's not a bit fruity. And the valves are open so the water can flow. Thomas Crapper's finest. Oh, look at that. <laughs> don't forget soap, Chief. I've got all of it, I? God, it's a bit nervous. Right, come on. 
The steam engine is working like a dream, but where's the water? Chief, we haven't got a lot of action. We've got only one water. Chief, no water as yet. Should be hammering through. Should be hammering. It's panic stations as they try to find the problem before the steam in the engine runs out. Give us some just a one. I'm just. Well. Could a dodgy tap be the culprit? Oh, yeah. Chief, chief. If the tap, tap's knackered, we'll have one. Oh, my word. Oh. Hell's oh, tea. No, 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 no. no. It's easy, everyone will be doing it, so we don't need to... Look at that. Are you drying your teeth? <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got teeth marks in my pencil now. <laughs> Chief, what would Watt and Bolton do in this situation? Uh -huh. Hey, well, James Watt. They won't go tearing in like a bull in a china shop, boy. Well, we're not doing anything. Sit and think about it, boy. All them pioneers are what they did. They must have many a time gone back to the workshop with a scratch on the edge, but they didn't give up. I'm not giving up. I reckon we've probably got an airlock. There we go. The system is bled, and they try again. Go on, go on, go on. Drain rods, drain rods, that's it. Everything else. Go on, Chief, get in there! Success. A steam-powered shower. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love you more than chips. Give us that soap, Chief. Give us the soap. Give us the soap. Give us the soap. Give us the soap. You've probably had the best wash you've had in years, haven't you? Ever. It's a multi-soap, mate. Hang on, Chief. Just keep an eye on the pressure, boy. Chief. <laughs> you have it! Get your ass off! Thing in my eyes, man. You're not supposed to put it in your eyes. Oh, you're sticking in your eyes. That's proper strong, that soap. Success! He's clean! We're out of water, Chief. We're out of water. Just going to try your send down. <laughs> we are the first Lincolnshire boys on a narrowboat in Birmingham with a steam engine to build their own steam engine powered shower. shower. Success, Chief. High five. <laughs> Both me <need> pants. <laughs> Next, Guy and Maeve's mission continues as they make everything you need for a good night's sleep. Chief, Chief, Chief. That is a boudoir, is it? a boudoir. This is Guy Martin part-time world-famous motorcycle racer and full-time lorry mechanic. He's not looking pretty. Inspired by Britain's noble history of engineering, Guy and his best mate Maeve are scouring the country for the best inventions of the Industrial Revolution to fit out Reckless, their aptly named narrowboat. We should be proud of being British and I think people need to know, don't they? They've already forged, thrown, flushed, and pumped their way through history. Give us that so, Chief, give us so. And this week, their mission is to make all they need for a good night's sleep on board Reckless. <sighs> Look at that. A mission that will take them right to the birthplace of British industry, the cotton mills. I don't think that's fantastic. Guys squeezing 200 years of British brilliance into one boat. The boat that Guy built. chilly morning in Derbyshire, and Guy has bravely spent the night on board Reckless. I've had better nights of sleep, but it wasn't on the best. Truck driver sleeping bag and um, hard floor. No, we need to get sorted. We need it, yeah. If we're going to do a job, we need to do it right. We need a bed. We need to sort the job out, don't we? The engine room floor is clearly not the best place for a kip. Guy needs a bedroom. Sounds like a job for Maeve's carpentry skills. All right, Chief. Go on in. We need a bed. Are you having a sleepless night, Tim? It's not happening, Chief, is it? Hey, a man without a bed is a man hey. with no home. <laughs> I reckon if you lay down there... Do you reckon we can make one? Yeah, of course. Can you make one? one? I'll make it for you, Chief. It'll be the best night's sleep you've ever had. Come on, then. Let's have a measure up. How do, what do you mean, measure, measure for a bed? We'll get you sent laid down there, I'll scribble around you, and we'll know where we're heading. You don't do that. <laughs> How tall are you? Five, nine, five, I reckon. Five, nine. According to this, were your boots on your six foot? 
What sort of width are we going for? Are we making it for two people, boy? Could we get cosy? Well, both of us. Yeah, I yeah, think. We'll make it four foot so we keep each other warm. That's what the, I SA, think so. what the SAS do. It's good enough for them, it's good enough for us. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're ready for action then, are we? Yeah, I'll get So it. I need to I'll make get... some sheets, or I? Yeah. I need to make a mattress. What do you know else. about making mattresses? <laughs> <laughs> the thick end are not a lot, boss. Sleep is an important part of Guy's routine. It must be clear of conscience because the boy goes out like a light, it's unbelievable, but he snores like a Perkins diesel. While Maeve starts the bed frame, Guy heads off to make some sheets, which, believe it or not, are one of the most important products Britain has ever produced. In the 18th century, innovations in the cotton trade were just as important as blast furnaces and steam engines in making Britain a manufacturing superpower. And the quiet Derbyshire village of Cromford is where it all began, with a man called Richard Arkwright. What a boy. A very greedy man, though, by the sounds of it. Money drove him. That's what makes a good businessman, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. He ended up richest man in the country. Arkwright the entrepreneur invented a water-powered spinning machine and combined it with semi-skilled labour all under one roof. It'll be the perfect place for Guy to weave his sheets for Reckless, the first ever factory. The constant flow of water into the Cromford factory meant Arkwright's machines could be powered 24 hours a day, and so the night shift was born. To see what an 18th century factory was like after hours, Guy will weave his sheets tonight. But first, he meets local guide Sally Mosley to see the revolutionary ways Arkwright attracted a workforce to the town. Oh, this yeah. was the first planned industrial housing in the world. It's, it's his first lot of housing for his, for his workers? For his workers. Each cottage held a family and... Oh, yeah. You'd get a few folk in them houses. You would. And size. there was an incentive because I believe that if you had ten children, you got your rent free. <laughs> ten as children? As long as those ten children could work <laughs> in the mill. The first ever factory town didn't just have houses. Arkwright also built a pub, a church, a school, and even allotments. The whole area is deemed so historically significant that even the pigsties are listed building. It's as heavily protected as Chatsworth. Honestly. As a stately home. Fuck. Ah, so. <laughs> And yet it's just it's a, a pigsty. Uh, it's a humble pigsty with grade <laughs> one listing. Well, it's, it's in better wrath than my bedroom. <laughs> and this was just supposed to give his workers a bit of independence. It so was. So they could earn, I suppose, extra, ex a few extra quid. It was to keep having them pigs, happy. Having... It was to keep them healthy. Everything yeah. he did, ultimately, was to protect his interests. Yeah. You didn't want an unhealthy workforce, yeah, did it's you? Yeah, money. It and if the sheets Guy weaves aren't up to scratch, Maybe he'll end up in another of Arkwright's buildings. He actually built a jail. He had his own jail as well. He had his own jail. For the most minor offences, you could end up in jail. Oh, heck. In 1787... Go on. ..Richard Arkwright was appointed High Sheriff of Derbyshire, which meant that he <laughs> could be judge and jury oh, to and, miscreants. And the employer as well. He was employer, he locked oh, them up, he decided their fate. You don't want me to lock the door and leave no, you in no, there, I'm ready she to happy. come out. I must get out she happy, she laughs. I'm hanging around. It's time for Guy's night shift to make his sheet at Masson Mill. With machinery powered by the mighty River Derwent, this factory was Arkwright's most famous achievement. And as only the rich could afford alarm clocks, workers were summoned to their shift by the factory bell ringing out across the whole town. I best get cracking. If I don't get down there, she out fish, someone else is going to have my job. So I've come to meet my mate Howard, and he's going to point me in the right direction. Now then, Howard. Hello, Guy. How How's it going, it? boss? You all right? Yeah, you? Good handshake. I like that. <laughs> I could learn a lot off you, and there's a lot I need to learn. I was just looking, boy. It's a fair old place here. Well, it's a piece of history, isn't it? Built in 1796, and uh, a working cotton mill to this very day. Ah, oh, heck. What can I do you for, then? Well. I need to make a sheet. Make a sheet. For my bed to go on my narrowboats. So you want to spin some yarn and you want to weave it into some fabric. You see, this is what I need to learn. Are right. we talking about getting it from the sheep's back? Can I just say, cotton does not come from sheep. It comes from plants. Is that right? Did you say you had a lot to learn? I have, obviously. 
after that bombshell, the first thing Guy has to do is make the thread that his sheet will be woven from on an 18th century spinning machine. Spinning is the process of taking the prepared cotton fibre. You can see it on the bobbins at the back there. Right. But you can see it's still fairly thick. Yes. But actually there's very little strength in no it. No strength there, is it? And what the machine has been doing is putting the twist into the cotton fibres and that gives it strength. In fact, if we untwist the yarn, then you can see that the strength just disappears. Oh, aye. But if we twist it back up together again, it will join on as if there was never a break in it. Ah, oh, yeah. Let's start the motor, that's sure the first thing we need to People have power. been lost in there with the looks of all that going. <laughs> so take off the safety catch, gently push the lever forward. Oh, okay, there it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the lever that puts the machine on. What do you reckon? Let it come back slowly. And away we go. As the spinning machine draws the yarn out, the spindles rotate at 10,000 revs per minute, putting the strengthening twist into the thread. The problem is the threads frequently break, and you have to find the broken end on the spindle and reattach it. So what are you doing there, then? I just put the string back on the spindle. Howard's years of experience are coming in handy, but for Guy, it's a right faff. No, oh, it looks hard, and it is hard. When we repair yarn like that, it's called piecing. Yes. And piecers are the most junior people in the mill. And they would start at the age of, say, nine or ten. Yes. You're making some progress here. <laughs> Another 20 years, I think you'll be quite an expert. <laughs> in the end, Guy has to stop the machine to catch the broken end of his thread, something that wouldn't have been dreamed of in Arkwright's day. They would never stop the machine. You don't stop the machine. You stop the machine, <laughs> your money is stopped. That's it. Yeah. Back onto the spindle. Well, I say it's not as easy, but I never thought it was going to be easy. Hey, you should wash your hands. I know, I know, I'm sorry. This blanket of yours is going to be quite dirty. You know? I know. At this rate, making a sheet for the bed in Reckless is going to take some time. I reckon that's enough. You'll do for me, Bob. I'll best get cracking. Neil takes Guy through the next stage, weaving the thread into a length of material. The thread is put into a flying shuttle, which then has to be carefully loaded into the machine. So push it through, that's called the shed. It's through the shed. Once it's in place, the shuttle's knocked from left to right between the orange threads, which run from front to back building up a piece of cloth. Yeah, let go. The shuttle travels at 60 miles an hour. Oh, get your hand in the way, then. Oh, no, you won't. don't want that. It really rattles in. This process makes about 10 feet of cloth every hour. It's a fantastic machine. You know, all the way everything's geared and throwing backwards and forwards in there. Well, I mean, well, we've still got leather straps on there. Oh, yeah. You know, not that they're pigskin. Yeah. The hammerheads are, the, are made out of pigskin. I just think that's fantastic. In 1770, the year before Arkwright opened his first factory, the cotton industry was worth around £600,000. A hundred years later, as a direct result of Arkwright's innovations, it was worth £40 million. Spot on, sir. Try and make a better job of this one. That's it. You reckon? There you are. I'm getting the hang, you see. Another week or two on that job. Pleasure to do business with you. Good job, sir. Thank you very much. Guy might have worked the night shift, but there's no time to put his feet up. He meets back up with Maeve on Reckless, who's still working on the bed frame. I've been a busy boy last night, boy. Hey, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Bed sheets made. <sighs> But you only do a certain length, so I've got I've got to sort it together. Let me feel the fibres of your fabric. I'm impressed. Let's get them spread out, Chief, and we'll get them stuck. We'll go on, we'll get them stitched together. I thought the cotton came from a, from a sheep. I know, mate. You do need a thrashing for that one. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the sheets still need sewing together, and it looks like it might take some time. So what? No, no, no. no. A bit of graft on here, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, well, I won't call it. Really I'll not hold my breath. The first stage of fitting out a bedroom for Reckless is complete. 
Now the boys need something to put their sheet on, a mattress. And for that, Guy's off to Hypnos, a fifth-generation mattress maker, who count the Queen amongst their clients. 33. Stan Jones has worked here for 40 years and starts by showing Guy how mattress fillings have developed over time. Yeah. It would have initially been made of straw with a hessian cover on 15th it. 15th century. Yeah. The top layer went to feather and down as well as the straw. Right, and then we yeah. would have put a velvet, they would have put a velvet cover of some form on it yeah. for the posher person. Yeah, that's not for me. I'm not the no, posher person, no. really, Stan. Posh or not, the straw attracted mice into the mattress. So alternative materials soon became popular. And then, oh, we, go, got then we go to horse tail. Yeah, horse tail. Yeah. They used a horse, horse tail. tail. Because it's, it's longer strands, it holds together better, it's more resilient. Yeah. They also went to lamb's wools. Oh, lamb's wool. So this is I've lamb's wool. I've learned a bit wool. about lamb's wool. I always thought it was cotton that came off lambs for some reason, and I didn't go down very well. No, that's the cotton plant. I know, I know. I, yeah. I, I learned that the other day. Yeah, yeah, I didn't go down very well. So here we've got the, the next stage, the 18th century. 18th century, yeah. Where we've got an open spring in it now. Right. A little bit of industry had crept into the bedroom. Hand-rolled bed springs revolutionised sleeping overnight, providing a flat, firm, shock-absorbing structure to snooze on. Guy will use their direct descendants for his mattress on Reckless, the pocket spring. What, what a pocket spring is? Well, hey, they were invented by an Englishman. Um, Another invention being Englishman. Yeah, it was an Englishman, but unfortunately he moved to Canada. Englishman James Marshall may have received a Canadian patent, but there's no denying his pocket-sprung mattress was a brilliant idea. Oh, heck. So you can feel it's gone up into the smaller your back here. The springs moved independently, supporting you where needed and not disturbing you if your other half rolled over in the night. Are you all right, Sam? Next, Guy needs to stuff his mattress with his own bespoke blend of traditional materials. This is horse hair. I horse won't put hair. it on top. What, the tail? Yeah, the tail part of it. Right. With the backing on it, it will stop all of your fillings going through. Right. We'll have a bit of that then. Yeah. This time-honoured technique uses a luxurious mohair stuffing. Uh, and would the, um, would the Queen have a mohair mattress as well? She... I think, if I remember rightly, she had... Just cow tail in there. Cow tail? Oh. It was all just hair. It's not okay. smelling the best, though, really. No, no, but it, trust me, you will not smell it through your bed. Yeah, like me on a wet day. And what, it's all for feel, so the difference between... It's all to do with feels. You ever use hamster hair out like that? No, I don't think so. You'd, You'd have to a shave of... a few hamsters, you wouldn't would, you? You would, wouldn't you? You'd shave a lot of hamsters. <laughs> Next, it's a couple of insulating layers and then the top cover. And on the label, it should oh, be telling you what's inside. It's your Look bed, it's your bed. <laughs> I'm impressed with that, boss. With the personalised cover sewn on, the mattress must be squashed flat so that it can be tufted, sewn together to keep all the stuffing in the right place. Push it like you mean it. The next stage of Reckless's bedroom is complete. A natural tufted mattress. But will all that graft result in a good night's sleep? Oh, chief. <sighs> Look at that. <sighs> yes. Back at the boat, Maeve's bed frame is taking shape and almost ready to accept Guy's horsetail and mohair mattress. Oh, chief, some of the, the word that goes into this, you would not believe, Chief. Hey, oh. oh, chief, personalised to though. me. It's about the guy oh, Check her out, boy. Hey? You're not worthy to lay on this. Chief. Honestly, I just thought a mattress was a mattress, boy. You get laid on this. Oh, Chief. You can see me having 40 winks fairly sharp. I think sharp. Go chief, on, yeah. swing in round. Go on. This ain't going in here. <laughs> Come on, Chief. Hang on, hang on. No. Go on. Hang on. Yeah. Go on. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Watch the cooker, Chief. With the mattress on board, just, there's only one thing left to make for the bedroom, an alarm clock. Anything has to be better than Guy's current method for waking up. Have you ever heard this? If you want to be up at six o'clock, tap your head, your, your fingers on your head six times. Right. And you'll get up at six o'clock. Is that right? I've tried it twice and it works. Right. But then I've tried it and it did, it did let me down once. So we're going to need someone that's a bit more reliable than a tap on the head. Clocks played an illustrious part in the Industrial Revolution and nearby Derby has a proud history of clockmaking. 
Local lad John Smith made his fortune as one of the most famous clockmakers of the 19th century. Look at that, Smith of Derby. The boys are visiting the biggest Smith's clock they can find at Derby Cathedral to research what they'll need to make an alarm clock for Reckless. All right, Tony. Uh, welcome. How's it going, sir? Uh, very well. Welcome Hi, to you Tony. both. Let's go up the tower. Good man. Lovely place you've got here, boy. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. The inner workings of the clock are halfway up the 120-foot tower. Right. There Welcome. Tom. First floor. Oh, and this yeah. is the clock, the clock room. Oh, hi. There's not a lot to it, is there? <laughs> well, is it? You think that great big thing outside? With yes. the time on it, you'd think it'd need a bit of a bigger working. Yes, yeah, it's quite a bit small. No matter what the scale, a mechanical clock is a very delicate, precision-engineered piece of machinery. It keeps time using a swinging pendulum, powered here by a suspended weight, which drops slowly as it drives the mechanism. To keep the clock going, the weight has to be regularly cranked back up to its starting point. Then a fella will come every week to wind the weight back up again, and that'll just keep... Oh, where'd he go? That's near mesmerising. Could, you could sit and oh, watch that all. Yeah. Fantastic. You could have the weight of the world on your shoulders, couldn't you? You could just sit and come and watch that. Oh, it could be worse. Guy decides to take his clock research to the extreme. Hi, Where are you? Oh. At the top. Well, you couldn't have picked a better day for it, could you? It's a bit misty, man. Asked by the rope access team to help with the cleaning of the clock. All right, Steve. Hi, guys. How's it going, Val? Good, good. Hi, Steve. Good to see you. Oh, yeah. He gets to experience what was the most dangerous job of the Victorian era. Yeah. I'm looking forward to this. I've never done any of this before. Oh, yeah. Right. Over. Yeah. During the Industrial Revolution, the rise of the coal-powered steam engine meant tall chimneys sprang up everywhere and steeplejacks were in big demand. Yeah. There was no training and the phrase health and safety hadn't even been thought of. No carabiners, no, no safety lines. No, down, down on a plane, yeah. Oh, well. Am I all right? Just to guide me, send down, push me, send off the wall. No arms. No arms. Good one. <laughs> Steeplejacks would have to climb up enormous ladders without any form of safety rope or lower themselves on a bosun's chair like guys, but without the harness. Lovely seat you got there, haven't you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Best seat in the house. Yeah. Where is it? I can't see it for them gargoyles. Yeah. Mega. Further down. Yeah. It's good fun, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Mega. Yeah. Yeah. Smiths of Derby still make mechanical tower clocks to this day, and they've recently delivered the biggest clock in the world to a tower in China. But as impressive as all this is, guys hit on a problem which would stop the clock working on Reckless. The pendulum rig that's inside this, fantastic that it is, is no good for being on a boat. You know, because the way a boat... Rocks. Even, even an narrow boat, I mean, there's not, I mean, it's not tidal route and there's no waves in a canal. But still, oh, it course, rocks with yeah. a bit of wind and yeah, all that, yeah. and that knocks the pendulum out of kilter, you see. Right. So I've got to get a, a way around. All right, we want this device, we want the same sort of mechanism, but we need it powered off a different device. We don't need it powered off a pendulum. We need it powered off, I don't know, and this is what I'm going to find out. Guy decides to seek advice from a clockmaker. If he wants a mechanical alarm clock on Reckless, it'll have to use something other than a pendulum to keep it ticking. He's come to see local clockmaker Rob James, who's been in the family trade since he was a young lad. Rob's found a very fitting timepiece to use for Guy's clock. Now, this is out of a mill or a factory or somewhere similar. Yeah. And the bottom dial here, you can put pins in, mm -hmm. and they'll flick the switch and it'll sound the hooter. So it'll be All right. first thing in the morning to get them into work. Tea breaks. Tea breaks, lunch, end of lunch. Oh, etc. Et but the problem with this is it's a pendulum clock, which is not good for uh, my good narrow for boat. Rob and Guy will have to adapt the clock so it works on Reckless, using a solution to one of the biggest nautical problems of all time. Where do you want me? Can I do it? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. In the early 18th century, with no accurate clock available to work on a boat, accurate navigation at sea was a real challenge. So many ships and sailors were lost that the government offered a prize of £20,000 to anyone who could find a solution. £20,000? I reckon I'd nearly chop my granny in for £20,000. Yeah. 
It was self-taught Lincolnshire clockmaker John Harrison who solved the problem. He refined one of his clocks by swapping the pendulum for a balance wheel, something that would be unaffected by the movement of a boat. So rather than the pendulum swinging to and fro, yes. this is doing exactly the same thing, but on a constant arc, a constant circle. Right. This that, fellow that, here that we're looking at here? Yeah, that's the balance wheel. Harrison went to great lengths to prove to the Admiralty that his idea would work. He walked from Barrow-upon-Umber down to London to go and present this. He walked, proper walked. Now, what's all that about? That's commitment, that, isn't it? And even when he achieved it, they didn't believe he'd done it. They kept sending his, his, his machines off on boats, coming back again and thinking, well, yeah, it's pretty good, but could it just be luck? You know, can he really do this? Yeah. Until such a point where they had to pay him, because it was £20,000. Oh, heck. Heaps of money. And these oh. kilometres were half the price of the boat. Uh, wow. So we're talking millions. I can well, put it in today, today. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Fortunately, it's not such an expensive job these days. Guy just needs to make a new cog in order to fit a balance wheel like Harrison's to his old mill clock. Right. A few final touches and Guy's cog is finished. Once it's in the mill clock, the balance wheel can be attached instead of the pendulum. So we'll just gently get that into something like position. Can't turn it that on? Yeah, right. just tighten it up just yet and then... Yeah? Look at that. Look at that. Thanks to the balance wheel, the clock's ticking over nicely again. But Guy still needs an alarm, and he's got an idea. The cotton mill I was in had a great big bell to get them to work in the morning. And I need someone that's... Maybe not that, because you could hear it from four miles away. Mm. I don't really think I need someone that big to get me out of bed in the morning. So if I get you a bell, I'm sure I can dig one out from somewhere. You could rig us up someone to eat it. Of course we can. To get me out of bed can. in the morning. Absolutely, yeah. Guy leaves Rob to work on an alarm mechanism and heads back to Maeve to see his completed bedroom. Hi, hey, Chief. Hey, boy. Thought I'd turn your bedroom into a bit of a workshop, if you don't mind. Chief. 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 That is a boudoir, is it? It's a boudoir. For Monsieur Martin. I didn't know you had it in you. Look at that. You made that yourself? You made the door? Yeah. And Maeve's got another surprise for Guy. He's found a bell for the alarm clock. You're going to be very proud of Mavis Davis, I'll tell you this. Go on. Come and have a look at this, boy. Okay, what Just we got? come and have a look at this. I could even say I'm mildly excited. Heck. Just check this bad boy out. Why, oh, actually. Oh. That's going to get me out of bed in the morning. That is going to get you out of bed. That is going to wake him up in Mongolia, Chief. Mm. I reckon, Chief. Go on. I'm thinking something like that in like a, um, a big frame. Like a carriage that bells do hang in. You know, like oh, what are you doing? Do you have it swinging in every direction or swinging front to back, side to side? I don't know, really. I just thought I'd maybe. Is hang it going to be a bit of trial and error? Chain, yeah. I like a bit of trial and error. Yeah, exactly. All right. All I know is this is heavy. While Maeve knocks up his sturdy frame for the bell, Guy navigates up the canal for the final part of the mission to meet with Rob the clockmaker and fit the alarm clock to Reckless. Rob, Maeve. Maeve, Rob. Right, right. Right. What do you reckon? It's fair, I think, isn't it? To sound the alarm, Rob's made an automatic bell clapper out of a windscreen wiper motor, triggered by the clock. That'll not be coming off in only one. The clock is fitted, and Guy sets the pins for six o'clock, just a few minutes away. Right. I reckon we're not far off at that. If he's got it right, it should go off any moment now. Anticipation, see what your ends. They're very excited. We've nearly run out of daylight, haven't we? Uh -huh. See, so you better have it than the donger there. Oh, 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 oh. oh bad timing, that one. Eh? Well, it's not going to wet the dead, is it? No, it's going to no. wet you, don't it? It'll wet me, but I don't think it's going to wet the neighbour. No, it's six o'clock in the morning, mate. Oh. It'll scare oh, the living daylights out of you. You'll think a ghost ship's coming past. It'll get me out of bed. It's yeah. the biggest bell on an alarm clock I've ever seen. Yeah. Is that right? Well, that'll do. That'll do for me. It's a beauty. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, John Harrison. And I love you, Bell. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks a million, Bob. With Harrison's clock, Arkwright's cotton sheets, Maeve's bed frame, and a mattress fit for the Queen, a good night's sleep is finally within reach. We're getting a mucky. What's your feet? Oh, Show some respect. I can't believe Show I'm getting a lecture about being mucky off you. <laughs> oh, well. Okay. That's me stitching. 
I think I need, need to go back to all, all my economics. All my economics. Come on. Yeah, I think we'd both benefit from a trip back to school, wouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> Bed making's not our strong point, is it? I don't know. I think well, it's in the breeding boy. Right. Oh, so right. It's not bad, is it, really? All right, I'll get you something. Go on. This mattress has already got a grip of me, and I don't think I want to get off it. It's absolutely fabulous. This will have to do for, for the time being. Oh. Right, Merv, are you coming for the duration? Oh. Oh. Hey? Well, no, I don't think so. I mean, I like your bed, and I know you're me mate and everything, but you don't, wa you don't wash. You're not particularly handsome. <laughs> no, I can't like, go home. What? That is a lovely bed. Right. Have a good night, Chief. Thank you very much. And I'll have a snooze. Oh, See a good mattress, though. A good mattress. Personalised mattress. <sighs> Next, it's time to make a great British snack aboard Reckless. <laughs> what are you doing? But before the boys can cook up beans on toast, Guy has to make a tin can. They're probably nobody's done it like this for the best part of 200 years. And nobody's ever made beans like this before. <laughs> <laughs> this is Guy Martin, part-time world-famous motorcycle racer and full-time lorry mechanic. He's not looking pretty. Inspired by Britain's noble history of engineering, Guy and his best mate Maeve are scouring the country for the best inventions of the Industrial Revolution to kit out Reckless, their aptly named narrowboat. We should be proud of being British, and you know, I think people need to know, don't they? They've already brewed tea. <laughs> Cheers, young man. Cheers, bro. In a homemade iron pot, yeah, built a steam-powered shower, and made their own sheets and a mattress. <sighs> Look at that. This week, they'll make their own cutlery, bread, and a tin of baked beans for a unique culinary experience, Industrial Revolution style. <laughs> it's all about packing two centuries of British brilliance into one boat, the boat that Guy built. The boys are in the Midlands, and Maeve has been working hard on the latest improvement to Reckless, a kitchen. She's coming on the treat, boss. Hi. Hey. It's going to be worth living in, won't it, the old girl? Tell you what, yeah. Looking the part, isn't it? Right, give us a list on this work, Tom. All right. <clears throat> I'm impressed, though. Yeah. We'll get there, we'll get there. Are you off to put kettle on? That's where I'm going. Good man. Get the brew on. Yes. Peachy. Great. The kitchen is going to be an essential part of Reckless. You all right, boss? Same time. Brew up. Because although the boys are settling nicely into narrowboat life, the food they're eating leaves a lot to be desired. Are you had a look in there, Chief? Of course I have. See, that's right, we're eating. Yeah. You're eating. Well, yeah. Not good for my diet, Yeah, but that. we haven't had out decent to eat. What Chief, are we going to do? Well, I've got a plan. Go on. English invention. Yeah. The tin can. And I want beans on toast. Well, but we that means a... we'll be nearly self-sufficient. If you can pull this off. Ooh. We're getting quite domesticated, boy. So you're actually forgetting there, aren't we? We're going to get laughed at. Do you reckon? Oh, all right. Get laughed at. Well, whatever way, Chief. The boys want a proper, wholesome meal of beans on toast, which means baking bread, then finding a way to toast it. First, though, Guy needs to make a tin can to store his baked beans in. He heads to Cannock in Staffordshire to find out how tin cans revolutionised food production by giving things a shelf life. Gameson's tinners have been using the same techniques to make tin plate for nearly 200 years. All right, lads. How's it going? You all right? Well, so go on, I just need a few bits tinning for me tin can. I've got to have my goggles on, I reckon. Yeah. Where, where do I start? The basis of Guy's 19th century tin is an extremely thin piece of wrought iron, which he needs to prepare with acid and a chemical cleaner called a flux, so that it will properly bond with molten tin. It comes out of the acid. Over in there. Into the cold water to cold swell the water. acid off, yeah. Yeah. Then into the, and then in the flux. Yeah. Then you just put it on there. Over there. And I'm going into this pallet. Inside this vat is tin heated to 300 degrees. Once it covers the iron plate, it will make the iron corrosion proof and perfect for preserving food and guys' beans. If you see it spitting, just lift it back out. How much a tin have we got in there? Fair to 
roughly an half ton. Yeah. It's not cheap stuff, is it? No. Well, what's our money's worth in there, then? Oh, there's 50,000 there. 50,000 quid. Then just drop it in the acid swill. Yeah? And that's done. Look at that. Like a new one. That's the best one yet. In it? We'll yeah. finish that. That's the best one yet. Hey. Good job. <laughs> so far, so good. Guy's made his tin plate in exactly the same way as they did in the Industrial Revolution. Now tin historian John Nutting will help him make it into an actual tin can to store beans in. So where do I start? First of all, you need to put the, uh, the, the, the lap on the end, the joint on the end. That's the first right. thing. So, so it joins the two ends. The biggest consumers of tin cans were the Navy, who loved being able to preserve food for long voyages. They kept a lot more than beans inside them. They were cooking things like uh, vegetables, carrots, um, veal, meat products, broth, um, anything that was nutritious as far as the, uh, the sailors were concerned. Get the That's calories the into the sailors, yeah. Precisely. Right, so we'll have a go at bending this. I don't think this is going to be an easy job, by I don't reckon. Rolling by hand may look rudimentary, but it's a tried and trusted technique. There we go. What do you reckon? 19th century tins made exactly like this could keep their contents preserved way past the sell-by date, as proven when some provisions for an Arctic expedition were discovered years later. They found the cans in the stores, some were opened up, and the food was in reasonably good condition even then, and that was 115 years later. Would you have eaten it? Uh, I would give it a try. You would? We'd taste it, wouldn't well, you? Of course you would. You'd give it a shot. Of course so, you would. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, like a new one. Now the next step is to cut some more tin plate out in a circular form. Yeah. And then fold it over the ends. It's slow work, and back then factories were only producing about 60 cans a day. Oh, I do like these. They're nice. Um... Today's factories can knock out about 2,000 a minute. Right, John. So I've got my ends done. We need all drilling now, do we? Now you've got to cut a hole right. in, in one of the ends so you can you've got enough space to put the beans inside first of all. Right. That's, uh... We'll go find a sensor drill. Oh, aye. That's perfect hole. Grand job. That's not perfect, is it? It'd be a long shot. You've got to remember, probably nobody's done it like this for the best part of 200 years. So you reckon uh... not? <laughs> <laughs> That's working very well, I think. You reckon? With all the pieces made, Guy must solder them together. When was a bean first put in a tin? That was about 1880, or thereabouts. Ordinary people wouldn't have had this at first, so it was used for... It was like, you know, the, the sort of special foods that would have been used in the space shuttle. It was high technology in those days. And so it would take about another 20, 25 years before ordinary people could buy these sort of foods. Well... There you do. OK, how about that? Look at that. The first tin. Oh, that's not bad, is it? That was 1824 version, I think. Yeah, I'll tell you that what. It looks as knobbly as yours does, doesn't it? I reckon it does. Yes. Look at that. Peachy. Marvellous. Well done. Guy heads back to Reckless. All right, Chief. To proudly show Maeve the fruits of his labours. Now then. Now then, Cocker. What are you on with? Chief, we have a bit of success in the bean tin department. Ooh. You've been busy, haven't you? She's home brew, Chief. I can tell. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't look like something I've just dragged off the shelf <laughs> in a well-known supermarket chain, no. does it? <laughs> Definitely in cheap, no, isn't it? No. Definitely in. Well, that's the size, that's the original. Is that right? 1824. Well, that's when you started using it in expeditions. <clears throat> that's what it was all about. That's what it was first developed for. Like the days of Captain Cook and all that. You've heard of Captain Cook, haven't of course you? I have. They'd be taking the food on the boat with them, but, you know, they'd be taking cows and sheep, but alive. Ready for slaughter when Yeah, needed. but they take the food to feed the cows and the sheep yeah, with yeah. them. Yeah, so they saved all that care for cheap. Oh, yeah, well, would they? Go on. Go on, then. Get cracking, Chief. Now the boys have to fill the can with some baked beans in tomato sauce that they can eat later, using a homemade recipe of Maeve's that owes a lot to guesswork. Hey, right, Chief, do you know what you're doing? I'm making sauce for the beans. Maeve, what's it all You've got more on the worktop well, than in the pan. Well, not known for my gastronomic skills. What are you doing, man? No, 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 scrape it out. Get off. I'm in the kitchen, you're interrupting my creative flow. Oh, what? It really do look like you know what you're doing. Hey, yo. Look at that. You've done that before, haven't you, mate? Oh, yes. Anyway, Chief, Chief you've, you've lost me. What's happening here? What oh, I'm just doing? making a sauce. So we've got a bit of what? Tomato puree? Yeah, 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 yeah. I just thought I'd put... Mate, what are you doing? I'm just putting a pinch of salt Have you pinched your salt? Yes. A pinch of salt? <laughs> when baked beans were first introduced to Britain, they were considered a fine delicacy. Buongiorno. 
Fucked. How do? Sold only in fancy grocers, Fortnum and Mason. Probably one of them shops that you go to. But you no. what? I've right. heard of it, maybe. Oh. I've heard of it, and no more than that. It's in that um, village, London village, I think, as far as I know. Oh, is that, that funny place downtown where yeah. everything's dear? We've but... got to get them fellas in there. So I assume we're, we're going to mix the two together and it'll go through the funnel. Huh? Oh, look at them beans going in there. Are you going to give it a stir? <laughs> what are you doing? Right, hold that in there, driver. Chief, a bean's not going to go through there. We're going to get a bean through there. Oh, <laughs> that noise doesn't fill me with confidence, Maeve. Wait, like, it's like standing behind the back of a horse, isn't it? <laughs> Maeve, I don't know what else to do. Oh. <laughs> hey, yeah, you're getting somewhere now. Chief, what's that? Don't take any fingers. Like right, that. A bit of encouragement with your spatula. Come on. But still, no joke. No, Maeve, Maeve. Never has a tin been made with such love and devotion. Well, there's no other way of doing this. Do you know, I couldn't see it, could you? I mean, it's plain common sense to do it this way. Of course it is. To complete their historic canning process in the most authentic way possible, the boys first cook the beans inside the can, killing any bacteria. Then they heat them further with just a small hole left in the lid so all the air escapes. If Guy's soldering is perfect, no oxygen will get in, and the beans will be preserved for a proper meal on Reckless at the end of the week. What about that? That's not bad, but it's all right. Are you all right? Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah. In the meantime, there are plenty more jobs to be getting on with, not least making something to eat their beans with. And there's only one place to go for great British cutlery, Sheffield, the city of steel. One business that flourished here during the Industrial Revolution was William Yates. Guy's come to see David Wilkinson to learn how to make his own knives and forks. All right, Dave. How's right. it going, boss? All right, mate. The first job is to carve a knife blade into a pre-forged length of steel. It's a product that can be traced back to 1751, when a man called Benjamin Huntsman invented a way of making really pure steel. I mean, this is a fair sort of cutting-edge method of eating your steel to 1,600 degrees. But that's where the secret came from, was the temperature. You could get it up to 1,600 degrees, and this made separating your, uh, your steel from the slag a lot quicker. So, therefore, ending up with a better end result, a better steel, Sheffield steel. Huntsman kept his new steel-making methods a secret. That's, that's not bad. That's a lot bit more there. Until, so they say, his main rival tricked them out of him. This cheeky, young scallywag called Walker went round to Benjamin Huntsman's steel work to suss out what was going on. But not only that, he went round as a tramp pleading poverty, you know, and um, other says, oh, you can sleep in there, it's warm and what have you, and they let him sleep in the, um, inside the steelworks. Anyway, what did he do? Had a look round, he could see what was going on with the whole 1600 degrees method, the whole separating the steel from the slag method. Anyway, that was it. Once Walker had got this idea in his head, that's it, he went away and did his own thing. But then, once the method was out, that was it. Oof. Sheffield was away with it. Pressure at the bottom. Yeah. Just once at the top. Sheffield soon became the European centre of steel production and was home to a staggering 97% of Britain's cutlers. Good job. Thank you. Yep. Cheers, boss. Great. So where to now? With the knife blades shaped, guys got to make some handles as well. It's all right, Keith. Where do we start? Up to the stop, carefully. Right in. We, uh, I'm, I'm nearly on the production yeah, yeah, line, yeah, boy. You're nearly a professional. Come on, now, we're here now. Yeah, we're here yeah. now. Come on. Now he must stick the blades into the handles. That's it. First guy has to drill a hole in the centre. I like your leather thing. That has look at that. I've seen some action, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's older than me. Right. Fantastic. Then he has to force the blade into the opening. Has it gone all the way to the top? Right, that's it, guy. Check it out. Oh yeah, job right. done. Impressed with that. That definitely ain't going to come off in a breeze, that, is no it? Way. Then it's a nice bit of buffing. And a further bit of polishing. Before a final sharpen. But that's not enough to shovel down beans on toast. It's over to the rest of the William Yates team to show Guy how to make a full set of utensils. Give it just one almighty tug. There you go. Look at that. That's took the gate off. And Guy won't be happy without a nice set of teaspoons, too. 
So I've nearly got a full set of cutlery then, and we're nearly laughing. Well, not technically, because spoon isn't cutlery. You what? A spoon's not cutlery? The definition of cutlery is something that cuts. So a knife's cutlery, a but nice a spoon cutlery, and a fork ain't cutlery. They're not cutlery now. And now he's got to shape his spoon on the fearsome fly press, which stamps down with ten tonnes of force. Hey, look at that. It's a nice shape, that, isn't it? It's not all brute force, this. It doesn't need ten tonnes. It will do delicate stuff. Go on, what would you use that for? What's that, like a necklace It is or a something? necklace. What have you got real near, Steve? It's the full Lord's Prayer. Oh, yeah. Who's made the die for that, then? It was a, a chap called Edwin Pryor in the 30s. We just fetch you the die. Now that's the die that we use, and it was handmade, hand cut. Oh, yeah. Even though Guy's cutlery is finished, the job isn't over. Each and every knife, fork, and spoon made here must pass the exacting standards of Anne in quality control. Well, right. uh, I've had a busy day today. Oh, yeah. Got all my eating implements ready. All right. Can you give me your opinion on them, please? Okay. And be honest. I will. If any item has even the tiniest flaw, it'll be rejected. Yeah, they're gorgeous. Happy yeah. enough? I am, yeah. Do you want a bit of etching, you reckon? Yep. Right. Finish them off, that. How to do that? Come over here. Right. And the final touch is... That's it. Tick it off. The mark of Sheffield Steel. Stainless Sheffield, England. Next on Guy's agenda is the second most important ingredient of beans on toast. Toast. Bread used to be toasted simply by holding it over a fire. We need a proper electric toaster, don't we? We're going to have to get on the case. Toasters, toasty makers, microwaves, in fact, none of the appliances we take for granted would exist were it not for the greatest discovery of the 19th century, electricity. Up until then, it was just like a bit of a party trick, I suppose. People would sit and watch the thundering sky and see the lightning come down, and people would think that was fantastic, but no one, had, no one besides Faraday could say, oh, my God, you know, we could make something of this. Michael Faraday, a poor blacksmith's son from Surrey, started off as a bookbinder's apprentice. One of his customers got him a ticket to go to a Humphrey Davy lecture. Humphrey Davy was like a well-established scientist of the day. And, um, yeah, that flicked the switch in Faraday, in Michael Faraday, the 14-year-old lad. That flicked the switch inside him. Then Faraday knew he wanted to devote his whole life to, to the science, really. He knew the best way to do that was to get in with, um, with Humphrey Davy. Humphrey Davy gave Faraday a job as a lab assistant at the prestigious Royal Institution, and before long, he was conducting his own experiments, including making a machine to convert movement into electricity. While he was at the Royal Institute, he invented the Faraday spinning disk, which was a way, yeah, of creating electricity. Fantastic. I reckon we should make one, Chief. What? These Faraday disks. Oh, all right. We're going to have a go. Pull her in, Chief. We'll get cracking. Guy gets a few essential Faraday disc ingredients delivered and leaves the rest to Maeve's carpentry skills. Yeah. Magnet either side. Yeah. We'll spin this. We'll get a bit of electric. Electricery. Electricity. Go say that again. Electricery. Electricery. Faraday had discovered a phenomenon in physics. Moving a magnet near a metal wire produced a pulse of electricity. Now he wanted to produce a steady current of electricity which could be used to power machines. Does that go in there, driver? If you just tap them home gently, like talking a cylinder head down, Chief. Faraday rotated a copper disc between two magnets. Although it was inefficient and only produced tiny voltages, it proved the theory that you could generate electricity. Yeah? Roll with it, baby. Look at Look that. Look at that. She's a beauty. It's working. 6.2 millivolts of raw power. Go on, we're going to get to 10 on, millivolts, and we right. aren't giving in it until we've got to 10 millivolts. Right, you had 7 points. The quicker you spin the disc, the more electricity you make. 7.6, 8 points, 9 points, oh, 9.4. Oh, Chet, I ain't giving in, Chief. We're having it. 9.4, then. 9.4, right. Why? You've got it, we've got it, we've got it. Yes! Oh, I saw that. Robert. Five. Yes! yes. It may only have produced millivolts, but within the century, Faraday's hand-cranked disc evolved into massive steam-driven generators that powered the nation. 
we really can thank Faraday for switching on the toaster and all our other appliances. That is the first dynamo. What Faraday did, he's the man, isn't he? He's the Check one. him out. Enjoy Inspired by generating their own electricity, Maeve makes it his job to find an old electric toaster to help make their meal of beans on toast. Guy's final job is to visit a traditional bakery and sort the bread. We've got to dress you up a bit smarter than that for making bread. What's wrong, I'm with afraid. What's so it? I think we should start with washing your hands. Well, you'll not get foot and mouth off them, Colin. No, oh, I don't know about that. Colin Lomax has been a baker at Hovis for over 35 years. When in Rome... Let's have a look. Turn them over. They'll do. And he knows all about Britain's contribution to baking history. Does your mum get you ready in the morning? With the invention of wheat germ bread. Give <laughs> me mum get me ready. <laughs> wheat contains about 85% white flour, about 12.5% bran, and this wonderful magical stuff called wheat germ, which is really good for you. In the late 1800s, wheat germ was steam roasted to make a healthier flour on a massive scale. The only other things you had to add to make bread were water and yeast. Oh, I thought yeast was always like a powder. No, this is a traditional baker's yeast, and it really has it's to be looked like after. Is yeah, it? Yeah. You see that? Yeah. It's one of the most important raw materials. You can't make bread without yeast. Mm -hmm. And this is a living organism. But if you taste it, it's a really lovely flavour. That lovely yeasty flavour. It's said to be good, really good for you. Was oh, it? Yeah, do you want some more? Then? And it's got to be treated extremely gently. It doesn't like extremes of heat. Oh. You can kill it with hot water. Mm. You can freeze it and you can kill it. And it doesn't like extremes of... We put a bit of salt on there. It's not going to start swearing at us, is it? If we it do might it. do. Can we, we can offend yeast more. quite easily, can and we? And then just rub it in. Well, let me have a go at this. All right. Let me see what happens. Hey, up. You see that? Yeah. So it doesn't like that at all. So you're probably eventually killing it. Also, it's so screaming we, at us there, is it? So when we make bread, we have to yeah. be extremely careful. Not to offend the yeast. In essence, bread making hasn't changed much since the ancient Egyptians and Romans. So we've got the flour, I want you to make a beer. Just mix the ingredients. So now we've got the yeast. Leave them to naturally rise, then bake them. But like so many processes, Bread making underwent significant changes during the Industrial Revolution. You're doing very well. If this is the first time you've done that, well, you're doing very can, well. My culinary skills go about as far as opening a tin of beans and <laughs> putting my toast in the toaster and applying a bit of butter, and that's it. In the 19th century, Britain became much more conscious of health and nutrition. Push the dough against the table, so you're creating a bit of a mixing action. We may have been making advances in science and medical technology, but the cramped and smoggy industrial towns did nothing for people's well-being. Hovis founder Richard Smith was convinced his new type of wheat germ bread would provide a much-needed health boost. Yours is looking a little bit more presentable than mine. But putting quite a bit of your uh, strength into that right. to really develop the dough into a nice, smooth consistency. Smith went all out to prove his bread was good for you, even getting doctors to endorse his products. Wonderful, so put that down there. The marketing worked. Soon his bread was being snapped up by the health-conscious Victorians. That's really good. What we've got to get to do now is get them into the prover. Fine, I'll put mine on the top tray. The proving cabinet is where the bread is left to rise for 40 minutes. Enough time for a nice tea break before it goes into the oven. Guy, you can see they've increased almost doubled in size. And Chris is ready to peel into this really traditional deck oven. It looks like it's come out of the ark. How old is it? <laughs> it's an old one. The deck oven is the same as those Smith would have used, except these days it's fired by oil rather than coke or wood. You'll see lots of bakers praying at the side of the oven is that right? once the bread's gone in. <laughs> <laughs> Time for another cup of tea, and then it's the moment of truth. The bread's ready, Guy. Why? Oh, I'm going to ask Chris to peel them out for us. Peel, peel them out. Like. That's the word, is it? There you go, Carl. Thank you. And traditionally, when you bang it on the bottom, if it sounds well, hollow, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Get a the lovely sound, yeah. sound. Definitely. You know that the bread's baked. So we've got a lovely loaf, nice shape, and that's ready for coming out of the oven. He hasn't done too badly at all, except for that little one on the end. Yeah, he's the black sheep of the family, that fella. Poor little bugger. Hey, could be worse, can't it? Back on the boat. Now, young man. Maeve has come up with the goods too, with a very old toaster indeed. Oh, actually, if you've been busy, what have we got here? Well, that, that right, is a replication of the first electric toaster oh, yeah. called the Eclipse. This grandfather of toasters was invented by the fabulously named Colonel Rooks Evelyn Bell Crompton, who also Bell. built one of the first ever power stations and set up a company making some of the earliest electrical appliances. A risky business in the first days of electricity. A lot of his first electrical appliances used to actually catch fire because he used iron, iron wires. See him? Oh, aye. I think we'll be all right, Chief. We'll get our door stops in there, boy, won't oh, we? Aye. Well, yeah, mate. Hey. What do you reckon? Good inch? And I reckon we'll get some good door stops out of them. Yeah, it's a replica of the original Horvis bread loaf, boy. It's not that old, is it? We've got some little baby ones, and I've got the full-size job. And then, of course, there's the cutlery. So here we go, we've got a forks. Let me have a look at one of them, can I? Stainless steel, Sheffield, England. I heck, I could do with air course. Mm. The boys finally have all the ingredients for a slap-up snack of beans on toast. As long as the beans have survived the week in their homemade can. Wires, the wires. Oh, you did a good job of that, didn't you, Chief? Hey, yo, look at that. The thing is, Chief, we're hungry. Yeah. Also, desperate measures. <laughs> <laughs> one slice of piece, I'll two slices. Two, boy. I say, I am right looking forward to these beans on toast, boys. Hey, yo, young man. Have a look at them. Hey. That is culinary excellence. Right, where's the pot? Right, what she send, Chief? I'm tipping these beans in hey, here. Up, go on. Do you remember how much salt you put in them, Chief? That's the only thing that's worrying me a bit, really. Why? That was a lot of salt. It's only a pinch. Go for your life, boss. Go right. for your life. Look how long that. do you reckon? You've done a job of that. I'm impressed. <sighs> We've got serviettes, maybe. We've got serviettes. Yeah, hey. I've got one here. Look, look at this. You know when you get a bit round your mouth. Oh. <laughs> right. My mother would kill me. Oh, she'll be right. Keep an eye on them beans, boss. The beans are looking good, but what about the volatile Crompton toaster? 1893, the old toaster. She hasn't set light to the torch yet, so she's not doing a bad job. Well, you're not far away. She's smoking like an old chainsaw. It seems to be working, even if Guy has to turn the toast by hand. And the posh cutlery is being put to good use. <laughs> Although probably not in the manner intended. Oh, heck, Chief. A bit oh. cremated. I'll have that one. I'll have that one. Right, come on. Yeah. Come on, Brian. Look at this young man. Hey. You're looking forward to it? Yeah. Chopping in the boot. <laughs> yeah, all right, all right. All right, young man. Yeah. How's it going? Now, Chief. Yeah. Beans on toast. Come on. This is the life. Don't right. you reckon? Are you ready? How are we doing it, Chief? Knives and fork. Come on, is that where we're going? Yeah, right. and you have to eat it like a student, look. Right, Chief, I'm going for a bit of a combination. I don't care what you're going for, I'm hungry. It's the moment of truth. Will Maeve's beans do justice to all that hard work and glorious British innovation? Maeve, <laughs> 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 they're bad. I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> you make me do it. Ah, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> The beans, the beans are rock are hard. hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can I can manage the rest? It's like eating gravel. The bread is absolutely fabulous. El fantastic. El, the cutlery. Oh, oh, they are something else. They are. They really are something else. The tin can. Well, they've been in there a day or two. Where is and it? And there wasn't rotten. It looks, it, it. it looks like some of the fire brigade have had a go at. It does. But Chief, it did its job. We can't knock it, can we, really? No, no. Mm -hmm. Right. Go on. The bean sauce. All right. It's not. It could do with some more salt. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, a, maybe a fraction. Chief, I would say that's a success. I'm a happy camper. <laughs> Good I'm going to finish him. Are you going to finish yours? No. <sighs> Next, poor old Reckless picks up a few more bumps and bruises on her travels. Oh, shit. <laughs> I do apologise. It's high time for a makeover, complete with some 19th century interior decorating. 
Guy's hoping his steady hand and eye for detail will make Reckless into the pride of... This is Guy Martin, part-time world-famous motorcycle racer and full-time lorry mechanic. He's not looking pretty. He's passionate about engineering and along with his best mate Maeve... Whee! I wish my legs were a bit longer. ..is paying tribute to his heroes of the Industrial Revolution by using some great British innovations to fit out Reckless, a neglected 60-foot narrowboat. We should be proud of being British, and you know, I think people need to know, don't they? They're touring Britain's beautiful canals and have already created a steam-powered shower... Give us out, kid, give us out. ..somewhere to sleep... Bed-making's not our strong point, is it? ..and homemade beans on toast. <laughs> This week, Guy and Maeve will begin to restore Reckless to her former glory. The boys will have to master the fine art of narrowboat painting... Oh, I've made a pig's ear of that now, haven't I? ..and make some silk for Reckless's interior using an early computer. Oh, you're away now. Guy is squeezing 200 years of British brilliance into one boat. The boat that Guy built. Guy and Maeve start their mission in Kidsgrove, Staffordshire, and can't resist admiring a true wonder of British canal engineering. In the 1800s, the now disused Harecastle Tunnel was the longest tunnel in the country. You need to go and have a look, don't you? I think you need to go and have a look. <clears throat> 1777, that was first built. It took them 11 years to build it, a one and a half mile tunnel, because of the granite in the hills. The tunnel was mainly carrying stuff in and out of the potteries because it was so much safer taking stuff through the tunnel because you won't get any breakages. You know, if you was taking them on the awesome cat and, you know, there'd be stuff brought and, and it just what you know, the profit would be out of the job, wouldn't it? You don't want that, do you? You don't want the profit out of the job, you know. No, so no, the, the fellows are queue for five days. Five days! Five days. So what happened then was, you can't have fellows stood about for five days, can you? Hey, five days on pay? Ah, oh, heck. You know, there'd be a lot of dry teeth, wouldn't there? We can't have that. We can't have that. So what we did, we built the other one. 1827, we built this one. Come and have a look here. She's looking a bit murky in there, isn't it? In 50 years, we've gone from a tunnel to the same length. 11 years. 50 years later, technology's come on. I think TNT's probably come on a bit. Pickaxes have come on a bit. Three years. Peachy. Travelling through the narrow tunnel unscathed is no mean feat. And Maeve seems to set Reckless up on an immediate collision course. Chief, 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 chief. Oh, chief, chief. I do apologise. I do know a stonemason. I'm not usually this bad, it's normally him. Cheers, boss. Thank you very much. Enjoy the trip. What are you doing with that line? Thought it might be Andy. Chief, it's freaking useless. <laughs> useless ornament. What? Impact. Oh, oh. Sorry, driver. Sorry. It took three years to build this, and I ran one trip through. We're about demolished it. It's like being in a dodger. The original tunnel was so narrow that boats had to be legged through. Hired men would lie on their backs on the boat's roof and walk their feet against the walls to push the boat along. We've not had an impact for five minutes now, but we're doing all right. Oh, don't say things like that. A treat of bread and cheese was all you had to tip your leggers to ensure the quickest service. Show a fair old noggin of bread. Oh, gee, hang on. I'm losing my concentration. Right. You're getting me all of a dither with your bread uh, and cheese. I know, boy. mate. You're getting all giddy, aren't you? Look that's at that. Thank you very much, young man. Oh. Well, you, don't yeah. you don't deserve a tip, that's for sure. Well, I'm starting to feel the fresh air now, maybe. Feel it. <laughs> Bit of fresh air. All right, boss. <laughs> Guy and Maeve have struggled to avoid collisions on almost every canal they've visited so far. Oh, yeah. I hope that bridge is all right. So unsurprisingly, today's trip through Hare Castle Tunnel has added even more battle scars to poor old Reckless. We've gone through to the metal here, Chief. Look, what happened here? Have you done that? Well... That's just chipped Chief, off. That's, that's, just look of, that's the look of patina. Been swapping paint here. Oh, heck. Are we at another boat, do you think? We both look like we've been dragged through a hedge backwards. Yeah. But I think the same can be said for a boat. We need to sort that out, don't we? Yeah, I think you're right. Bit of pride, yeah. It's time to give Reckless a makeover. She's done the boys proud at paying tribute to Victorian engineering, 
but just as important at that time was the business of looking good to show off your wealth. Guy and Maeve need to prepare the old girl for a lick of paint. Back in 1850, the old narrowboat job was going out of favour. All the money was being put into um, the railway job. Ah, and anyone to do with a boat was skint. Boat people, they got pointed at by the land people, if you like, saying, ooh, the dirty barges, and, you know, I guess you could say they're a bit of an outcast. They didn't like being looked down on by the landlubbers. And they says, right, we ain't got a lot of money. We ain't got a lot. But what we have got, we're going to make the most of. So that's just the paint and the narrow balls. All the colours under the sun, like a rainbow. We're going to make it look pretty, make it stand out. And here we go. We're going to make Reckless a domestic palace. Domestic palace with flames. But that will have to wait for a while. With torrential rain forecast, it's time to set sail. 16 tonne of boat and you can move it yourself, the man mountain that is Mavis. So we're gonna go, we're gonna go find a dry shelter for a bit of boat painting. They're on the Macclesfield Canal, which cost £6,000 a mile to build, whereas a railway would have cost £2,000 a mile. The local planners chose the more expensive option because they felt landowners wouldn't care for smoking trains chugging through their fields. And besides, a canal still represented a very cheap transport link. Coal for the factories and food for the people could now be delivered at a quarter of the cost of using the roads. Both rich and poor benefited from the canal. Guy and Maeve have made it to the refuge of Macclesfield Marina and are looking round the other boats for decorative inspiration. I mean, you won't paint your boat orange. I mean, come oh, on. Chief, you don't miss it on a dark night. Dum spiro sparrow. I don't know. It's, it's Latin, that, Chief. Is it? For what? While I breathe, I hope. Excellent. Like Are you impressed that. I know that? I like that, yeah. You know what this is, don't you? The Go diamonds, on. Go on. the circle and the crescent. That's like a trade match, Chief. These patterns of simple shapes were, in effect, the first logos. Insignia designed to identify a boat's owner at a glance. Guy and Maeve want similar individuality for Reckless's paint job. We need people to know that we are arriving, Chief. We, we, you know, we're Chief, yeah, but they're not welcome, Chief. <laughs> they're clattering and bangering. Were you at the helm, Chief? <laughs> <laughs> Hit everything at rabbit speed. I think the first protocol might be the panel beaters. <laughs> there you go. The boys lash up an impromptu shelter so they can start painting Reckless. No, oh, no, she'll be right, she'll be right. Reckless is transformation. It's all it's, going for. It's now in your hands and it's all running off and it'll be down the back of your hands. Look at the colour, Chief. A town like Macclesfield had 40 steam engines and 5,000 houses that needed to be supplied with coal, requiring a never ending stream of deliveries by narrowboat. The boatmen had to work incredibly long hours. Always found time for painting a boat, though. Hey, that's commitment for you. Really, the last thing these men and women wanted to be doing was painting the boat. But it just showed. Yeah, it just showed. Yeah, it just showed how much it meant to them. They wanted to be respected, I suppose, and they wanted to, you know, a bit of pride in the work, pride in the job. Yeah, we like that. It was a wonder of the grey, smog-bound industrial revolution that mundane tools of transport were turned into floating works of art. The back is nearly broken. You get finished off. Yeah. I'll go sort the interior. Good man. Peachy. Good man. Right, come with me. Macclesfield was an unlikely capital of luxury goods during the Industrial Revolution. Entrepreneurs developed the local button making industry into a centre for silk production. So Guy's off to see what bits of interior design he can find for Reckless. But as usual, he's become distracted. We were just mooching along the back of Macclesfield and um, we come across this. On this occasion, by something that was called at the time a most beautiful specimen of masonry. I mean, check her out. Check her out. It's a proper... Well, it's a mind-boggle, really. To find out more about this strangely curly bridge, Guy asks the experts, the locals. This bridge, what do you reckon to it? Snaking bridge, yeah. Snaking bridge. Are you into them? 
Beautiful bit of architecture was that. Good man. I think this is the only canal they have, Mon, and they were designed so that you didn't have to unhitch the horses when the towpath switches from side to side. See? There you go. You see? What an idea. What an idea. When the grass verge the horse walked along ran out on one side, the spiralling snake bridge allowed them to cross over to the other bank and let the horse, rope and boat pass underneath without getting tangled up. It's not just a bridge, is it? It's, it's more sort of thought out. It's yeah, thought. It's, it's not just a bridge, it's more thought out, yeah. I'm impressed, Chief. I'm impressed that you're impressed. I love stuff like this, yeah. Proper? <laughs> yeah. Good man. Yeah. Good man. Should keep it forever. You know all about them, don't you? Oh, a little bit. <laughs> he knows. See, he knows all about them as well. That's everyone that knows about them, except for me. It's wrong, isn't it? The canal didn't just allow cheaper goods to be towed in by horse, but it meant the town's wares could be easily exported too, notably silk. Guy's back on the trail of sprucing up Reckless's interior and visits Paradise Mill to see what luxury items he can find. Of the 120 mills Macclesfield was once home to, Paradise Mill is one of the last remaining. It's the perfect place to find a fancy accessory for the interior of Reckless. The silk made here was as good as it got, with an amazing 500 threads per inch. The work was exported around the world, and this delicate catalogue from 1855 shows the incredible variety of work that was offered. Just some of the finishes that you've got here. Today, this represents the finest collection of Jacquard hand looms in the world, and its system of punch cards was the key to those intricate designs. It was the first truly automated mechanism that mass produced complex patterns. Whatever the whole sequence is in the CAD, that's what the pattern that comes out on the silk, that's what it is. And it's dead simple, really. If there's a hole in the card, the needle goes through and picks the thread up and pulls it back. If there's no hole in the card, it hits it and it doesn't. Dead simple. I suppose you could go as far as saying a simple sort of, well, a very early sort of computer. Retired weaver Malcolm Sherratt describes how a silk pattern first drawn on squared paper was then turned into those punched cards. It's your machine now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Where do we start then? Well, what you do is put your hands over there and just press. You don't have to press them all. Press three or four of those in. Have you pressed them in? Yes, yeah. And yeah. then push down with your right foot. Yes. Let, let it go. And you've just put a row of holes in there. So it's a, it, the, the actual mechanics of it is quite simple. Oh, so if yes, you want yeah. to repeat that. Oh, yeah, I see. It took five years to become proficient with matching the buttons on the back of the machine to the corresponding holes in the design. Mistakes were easily made. Look at that. Oh, no, it's a bit, it's a bit wonky. Assuming they weren't wonky, once finished, the cards were fed into the loom. Well, you can see how it's all working up there. All the cards, them cards we were making earlier. You see? And that's dictating what's going on down here with the weft and the weave. Let me have a go, Malcolm. Let me right. have a go. Now press down with your right leg. Push the beater out. Now yeah. Guy can try his hand at weaving some silk to be used inside Reckless. Beat the thread in. Lift your right leg. Oh, you're away now. So, what's the usual shift on this job now? Anything from 8 to 12 hours on this. Your right leg would know about it, I think, would not it? Yeah. Actually, as years went by, it's your left hip that starts to take the strain, you see, and, that's, and there weren't hip replacement operations in those days. Is but that you right? will have a very well-developed right leg, that's for sure. I can imagine. Press down, keep in, down again. Let's say if I was doing this back in the day, what amount of material could I expect in a shift? First of all, I think you've done very well. But on a shift, I would estimate that you probably get about three metres printed, which may be just about the equivalent of a dress length. So, oh, uh, look at that, you'd probably hey. be looking at 15 metres a week. 15 metres a week? Hey, and you could see where the expense was. Oh, well, absolutely, because you were putting that across there very quickly, probably about 35 times a minute. Mm -hmm. But silk today is produced 
on powered looms, and there the weft is going in at, say, 350 times a minute, mm -hmm. or maybe even more than that. And that's so, maybe why silk now is a bit more affordable than what it was back then. Well, you're absolutely right about that, because most ladies these days could afford to buy silk. In those days, they would certainly have had to think twice about it when it was done like this. I can imagine. <laughs> that was an education, wasn't it? Hey? Oh, I've got silk pillow, hey? And look, Malcolm's done us a right favour. Give us some silk pictures for Reckless. Look at him. She'll look a treat, won't she? Hey? Back at Reckless, despite the weather, the first stage of painting has been finished. Here we are, ladies and gentlemen, getting attacked by a swan. And I am actually a little bit nervous because I haven't got any food to bribe its affections with. Anyway, so look at this. Doesn't she look fantastic? Or oh, resplendent in her new blue hue, Oxford blue, by the way. Look at the sheen on that. That is fantastic. Look at her. We've put the heart and soul back into her, and it's going to be a pleasure to be on the waterways with her. She's a beauty. I'm proud. I'm a proud man this morning. The next job is sign writing. Well excited. And to help with that task, Maeve has called in Meg Gregory a professional boat painter with a particular fondness for restoring historic craft. First of all, we're going to start marking up so we get it all straight and somewhere near level. Oh, yeah. Can you take that across to there? I reckon. Can I be trusted? You can. Meg is marking out the letters of Reckless on the side of the boat. Reckless. Eight letters. Yep. And as in the 1800s, there are no pre-printed outlines here. It's all done freehand. It's time to paint. Yes, yeah. Well, yeah. Brilliant, let's have it. Stop behaving like a schoolboy and uh, listen to what you tell me. So start at the top and take it down. I can't do that. You can do that. This process wasn't just about identifying your boat. It was also a way of touting for business. A well-written sign was an indication of respectability and reliability. You were people who could be trusted with precious cargo. What do you reckon? Am I having a go on the E? Yep. Over right. to you. Have you ever had a go at painting anything before? Um, my house. <laughs> That's it. What do you reckon? Excellent. That's a good first effort. Excellent. Is it? Yeah. I think that's going to look all right. Yep. What's this stick doing? I don't know, but I'm hanging <laughs> on to it for security. <laughs> The lettering was treated as another opportunity to be artistic, so florid fonts were used, or deep shadowing to give the appearance of 3D. Do you want your stick, Maeve? I'd like the boat to stop moving. <laughs> because the often illiterate boatmen would do this themselves rather than professional sign writers, the results were sometimes rather homemade and spelling mistakes weren't uncommon. But it was all part of the folksy tradition. So don't worry if you go over the lines, Maeve. He's doing really well. Excellent. Look at that. Yeah, he'll have that done in no time. Meanwhile, on the inside, guys decided the interior of Reckless might need a bit more work to turn it into a proper tribute to Industrial Revolution tastes. I've never, ever wallpapered in my life. So he turns to the most influential Victorian interior designer of them all, William Morris. Do we know him well enough? We know him well enough, don't we? We can call him Bill, can't we? We'll call him Bill. Our mate Bill Morris. Yeah. He trained as an architect. Very arty, we could call him. Very arty. Well, he liked to draw everything. He liked to do everything. You know, draw all the fruits. See, look here. Hey, up. We're starting to look so much like now, aren't we? Excuse the bit there. That's my scissors are out of calibration. I'm sorry. It's all right, isn't it? For me first go. Morris was the first to use repeating patterns to create impact. Oh, right. Something which is taken for granted today. I do, I do, I do, I do. It's a great idea, as long as you get every sheet to line up perfectly. Oh no. Fruits, this one's called fruits. Yeah. I don't know what fruits we're looking at though. Maybe an orange. 1866 this came out, did William Morris, and it's still going now. But when you ask me what fruits, I'd be lying. I don't know, can you tell me what fruits it is? 
Morris's insistence on hand stamping the designs was very symbolic. He felt aggrieved that the rise of machinery meant Britain was losing its skills and craftsmanship. Everything was becoming mechanised, wasn't it? Just produce it real fast. You know, roller printing would have been used to make uh, wallpaper. But no, 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 not William Morris. He didn't want roller printing to make his wallpaper. He was saying that we couldn't get this sort of detail with roller printing, and he, didn't, he wasn't happy. He wanted the job right. He inspired the arts and craft movement, the first signs of an anti-industrial reaction to mass production, smog, and long working hours. And along with the art came poetry. And I have a bit here from one of his most famous pieces. I'm not much of a reader, and I'm definitely not much of a poet. Definitely not much of a poet. <coughs> Forget six countries overhung with smoke. Forget the snorting steam and piston stroke. Yeah? Forget the spreading of the hideous town. Think rather of the pack horse on the down. Hey, what about that? Oh, oh I could get quite emotional. Hey, maybe that's me new. Maybe we've, maybe we've found some of us. Can we have? Guy Martin. Poet. Not before we witness Guy Martin artist, as he attempts the final stage of painting Reckless with the traditional boat decoration of castles and roses. So Meg, we're going to go for a bit of artwork. We are, we are indeed. These images have adorned boats from the earliest days of the canals. No skulls. No, and no sorry. flames. No, sorry. We're sorry. going for castles. We are. Right, so. Guy's going to follow Meg's every move to try and recreate a perfect copy of the scene she paints. What are we having Sky at the bottom for? This is going to be your water. It'll all become crystal clear in a bit. Hold your breath, everyone. You want to get some blue on that pretty quick before it starts drying. Yeah, yeah. When they used to do this on the working boats, they really wouldn't have very much time to do it. With brushing side to side mastered, Meg teaches Guy how to twirl and make some clouds. Use the whole of your brush and twizzle it round. Twizzle it, that's a technical term. Twizzle it round, it? yeah. There oh, you go. Heck, yeah, go, go on, go? right, I'm seeing, yeah. Twizzling. Yeah, and whack your brush that, that's it. Right round, yeah. Great, and then just fade it out at the bottom. Lovely. There you go, look at that. There you go. While the clouds dry, our artists make a start on the panel below and the roses. So what are we doing? We're going for yeah. another twirling. Yeah, go for a twirl, yeah. Twirl it right round. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Whee. Oh, that's that. Oh, that was almost all right. Oh, I've made a pig's ear of that now, haven't I? Flowers were popular because this was a time when botany became fashionable and fresh cut flowers were available to buy in markets for the first time. I mean, all this came from the day back when it was, um, you'd be seen fairly well of if you had a, a bunch of fresh flowers in your front room. But the folks in the boats couldn't afford it. So they thought, I know, I can't afford me fresh flowers, but um, I can paint them, so they paint them on. Back on the castle scene, and what are, apparently, hills are added with a mechanic's touch. Guy is a model of concentration. I think this is the quietest I've seen you, Guy. <laughs> That's fine. You reckon? Yep, yep. While those carefully crafted hills dry, Guy returns to the bottom panel and his pig's ears. If it had to be one to ten, where are we? Is one good or one...? No, one's, one, one's, one's used one's to man poor. and beast. I reckon you're on about a... Six, but oh, with geez, potential. Right. <laughs> potential. Hey, me and Meg. Maybe hey. five now. <laughs> Hanging landscape paintings on your wall became very fashionable in Victorian households. Larger pictures would have been transported into the cities on the canals. So the boat people were simply painting their own versions of the expensive goods they were carrying for the rich. Right, <laughs> should you rectify your roses? Can you do that? Can... Yeah. Are they, are they yeah, salvageable? They're, they're salvageable, yeah. Right, go on. Yeah. All it takes is a few deft strokes adding shadows and highlights. Always work from the outside back to the centre. To transform the circles of colour into flower heads with three-dimensional beauty? Well, I think if we had a month for Sundays, I could have the job mastered. <laughs> Meanwhile, should we have a cup of tea? Yeah, it's a cup of tea. Cup of tea, yeah. Look at the state of your mug. There's no way to treat Wedgwood. It's not for looking at you, it's for drinking tea. 
Fairy tale scenes like this were popular because they provided escapism from the drudgery of everyday canal life. But I can just imagine Bolt's people moored up outside a factory or in the middle of Manchester or in the middle of Birmingham or wherever. I'm getting in it now. And just, you know, you've, oh, you've got smog and you've all the caper of industry all the way around you. And then you could sit and look at your, your picture and you could just, yeah, you could get away from it, I suppose, couldn't you? Yeah. Now it's the make or break moment turning a few blocks of colour into a finished picture by adding detail with an expertly handled fine brush. Fine, oh, yeah, Proper taking shape, isn't it? Yeah. It's just a few brush strokes and you're there, really. Will these final finishing touches create a masterpiece? I think, you know, when I've got someone's backside as the, um, <laughs> as the clouds, and that's a bit wonky there, isn't it? I just thought... It's not looking good, is it? Yeah, look at the concentration going on. <laughs> Most people, you know, their first go would be on a on a bit of plywood in their in their garage, and to have to do it on a on a pair of back doors on an ice boat, that's that's quite a bit of pressure. Just a bit. So um, I think you've done really well. From a distance, hang on, I'm going to come back here. I'm going to come back here. Let's have a look. All right, it's not quite in Megan's standards, is it? But it sort of half looks like I know what I'm doing. Proper job. Chief. Chief. I'm impressed. Happy with it. <laughs> yeah. Good. I mean, from what Chief. it did look like, we sort of got a bit of a disaster <laughs> on his hands. And you stayed the ship grand. Thank yeah. you very much. I think we'll promote you to a nine out of ten. Nine out of ten? Yeah. For yeah. a first no, go. Good, good job. Hey? 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 <laughs> <laughs> Before the boys reveal the freshly transformed reckless to the world and make a triumphant return to the water, they mark each other's work. Right, Chief. Come and have a look at me, Andy. Right, yeah, I'm anxious to see, bro. Come on. Anxious to see. Have a look. My word. What we have here, <clears throat> with Meg's work there, hang and on, with my hang work on. here. Leap of faith. Come on. One of us is going to get damp by the end of this trip. I would imagine so. Have a look. Hey. Look at that. All right, I think my flowers are in a different league to, to Meg's. Mount me out of ten, Mount me out of ten. Mount me out of ten. I want to go for a very Brucey nine. Why, heck, Chief? Thanks very much. Hey? Well, as you've been busy doing this, yeah. come and have a look at my sign writing. Let's have a look. <sighs> what are we looking like, boss? Poke your head in there and have a look, Chief. Poke your head in there. There you go. What can you pick at? You can't really, can you? Proper and crafty, boy, that's yeah. what that is. Yeah, it is, yeah. Max out of ten. Chief, yeah. I'm saying again, nine. N really? Honestly. And with that, Reckless's shrouds are cast off. <laughs> The interior and exterior are once again ship shape. Now, there, boss, you look a treat, really. Your sign, Ryan Mavis. You like that? My castle scene. Fantastic. Oh, I've done a good job. Yeah. A fully painted, fully restored, reckless, full steam ahead guy. Hi, boy. Next, Guy and Maeve set out for their final port of call to reveal Reckless to the world at a grand celebration. They'll provide sustenance for guests... There's smoke coming off that! Yeah. <laughs> ..and capture their vessel for posterity. Pull your finger out, boy, I'm knitted. But they'll have to battle the harshest conditions they've ever faced. Look how thick the ice is. This is Guy Martin the world-famous motorcycle racer and passionate engineer. He's not looking pretty. He and his best mate, Maeve, have been paying tribute to the heroes of the Industrial Revolution by fitting out Reckless, a neglected old narrow boat with some great British inventions. Cheers, young man. Cheers, brother. This is the last leg of their quest, and Guy and Maeve want to reveal the finished boat and its Victorian-inspired additions to the world. They plan to organise a grand celebration, Show them off. laying on entertainment that dates back to the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. Feel easy doing. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to make some 19th century party food. It's a smoke coming off that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and battling the elements to take a photograph with a 150-year-old camera. Pull your finger out, boy. I'm knitted. It's time to celebrate the 200 years of British brilliance that's been squeezed into one boat. The boat that Guy built. 
Welcome to the final week. A severe cold snap has brought Guy and Maeve to the River Trent in Nottinghamshire because this is one of the few pieces of unfrozen water left in the country. Reckless is going a treat, isn't it? End of the adventure. Although when the temperature is minus 15, sooner or later you're bound to find ice. Is that frozen? This could all end in tears. Brace yourself. Oh, oh, listen oh, to oh, that. Oh, oh, oh. Listen to that. <laughs> that is ace. <laughs> We've definitely slowed, we've lost momentum. I feel like an explorer. <laughs> Harsh Victorian winters would often freeze the canals, so icebreaker narrowboats with double thickness hulls were built to clear the way. 18 tonnes of narrowboats against a bit of ice, there's only going to be one winner, isn't there? Only one winner there. Hey. <laughs> Look how thick the ice is. Three quarters thick. I ah, see that. Look how thick it is. The boys moor up in Newark Marina and have one week to make preparations for the boat's launch event. All the people who have helped them transform Reckless will be invited to celebrate this tribute to the Industrial Revolution and Guy's first task is to arrange some suitable nibbles. We're going to have a bit of a party, a few shandies, a bit of a shindig, but we need a bit of food, don't we? When I left school, I always fancied myself as a bit of a chef. Mustard at making carrot cakes, I was. Mustard. I think we might need a bit more of a handle. Very fetching, Mavis, yeah. very fetching. Look at that. Right, so Alan, you where do you want us, boss? You wash your hands, yeah? The lads have enlisted the help of food archaeologist Alan Coxon to show them how to make the definitive 19th century fancy food. Well, that way, 225. Yeah. A Victoria sponge cake. You've got the marge. There you go. Right. How much marge. Of that? You want 225 grams. Again, 225 grams. Right. Well, we're getting about there somewhere. Yeah? No? Mm. Oh, I can only play anything. Yeah, they come in bars of 225. Oh, oh look at that. <laughs> That's quite <good. laughs> That goes into that bowl there nice. with the whisk. It was Queen Victoria's favourite snack and came to prominence in the 1860s while she was mourning the loss of her husband, Albert. It was her comfort food. You don't do much baking then? No. No. None. No. I've only just put a kitchen in and that's took ten years. <laughs> <laughs> Our novice chef soon learned that Victorian cooking demanded an awful lot of elbow grease. Right, where do we go from here? Okay, right. I reckon I'm quite satisfied with that. What do you You're think? happy with that, right then. Now, yeah. this is where the work comes in. Go on. Right, because back then you didn't have the machinery. And even when the machinery did come in later on in the, in the Victorian period, it was hugely expensive. Of One machine, electric machine, uh, would actually cost probably a month's salary. So, it's all done with elbow grease. You're going to take your whisk and you're going to beat that until it's white and creamy. The better the whisking, the more air is trapped in the mixture to make the cakes light. It's all new territory for the lads, who struggle to make beans on toast. Hey, up, Chief, in the bucket, boy, in the bucket, on the floor. Just carry on and concentrate what you're doing, boy. This is the most important. If you try and cut corners on this, guys, then it's not going to work. So, Alan, at the time of these here Victoria sponges, yeah. At the time, you know, a load of new food was coming into England at this sort of time. Oh, you know, like the curries and what have you. Absolutely, yeah, the curry's a perfect example. That was one of Queen Victoria's favourites. Never. Really? She, she had a curry every Do Friday night. you think she'd be a Joe Frazier or every Friday night? Every Friday, apparently. Cool. She, yeah, she had a curry. Hey, we like her, don't we? She loves like curry. curry. What do you reckon, Alan? That is nearly there, mate. Nearly there. Nearly there? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so come, come on, mate, come I know, on. I know, I know, I know. I'm going. slacking. The Victoria sponge was a staple of a new phenomenon called afternoon tea. As ladies tried to squeeze into their fashionable corsets, it became necessary to have much smaller lunches. Gently. OK, put it all in at once. Oh, all right, sorry, boss. <laughs> but as a result, people soon found they started flagging around mid-afternoon. These are working man's hands, Chief. And I've got a blister making cakes. So one of Queen Victoria's ladies-in-waiting invented afternoon tea. A nice brew and a slice of cake to act as a sort of pick-me-up. And Queen Victoria got a hold of it and she started to participate, enjoyed the Victoria sponge, not forgetting that the oven's been invented, the baking powder's been invented, yeah, yeah. flour has, has become finer because of our methods of better production, and all those things came together to make baking 
um, very popular. With the mixture scooped into the cake tins, all the boys have to do now is bake their cakes. Oh, well, look at this. Hey, hey. Yeah, yeah. done it before. Hey. And about 20 minutes later, they find out whose is best. Now, be careful, because it might not be done. So, I must say, you've got to be very careful. By heck, mate. It's on secret Don't... service. Ah, it's looking good. It's looking good. Magical. Maves looks a good effort. Has Guy made perfect party food, too? Oh, heck. OK, close the door, quickly. Lots of pigs here, that. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey! Well, I wish I'd not seen that. Where's the dog? What's going to happen to the dog? Don't you, don't you feed that to the dog? I won't even put a dog she through that. <laughs> yeah, I won't put a, a dog through. After a few more minutes in the oven... <laughs> don't laugh. <laughs> not laughing! <laughs> <laughs> There's a smoke coming off that. Yeah. <laughs> it's safe to say Maeve's looks better than Guy's. Will adding the classic Victoria sponge fillings of jam and cream make the end of journey banquet one to remember? All right, from the centre, and then leave half an inch gap around the outside. That's it, good. A bit more. I'm impressional, ma'am. They threw me out of economics, Chief. <laughs> what was they thinking? And, Who's um, the one laughing now, maybe? Exactly. Who's the one laughing now? Let's taste right, it. Right, go on. Give us a slice and let's go right. for it. What are you reckoning? Down the middle. Down the middle, and then half it again. This is Alan Art, Michelin star rated. <laughs> the jam, it's sweet, it's tasty. Right. I had nothing to do with the jam. The cream, it's light. I had nothing to do with the cream. Go on, the sponge. Come on. <laughs> It is edible. It is edible. Edible. <laughs> edible. <laughs> that, that is <laughs> edible. On your first attempt. Excellent. Go on, Maeve. Get cut in, boss. Deathly silence. Look at that. Oh, no. Oh, mate. Oh, what? We've got some kind of cataclysmic <laughs> tectonic <laughs> plates or whatever it is. <laughs> got a landslide. <laughs> That's good. That's yeah? good, yeah. Mm. <laughs> That's good. Mm? I'll let you into a little secret now. I don't really like the Italian sponge. <laughs> well, that will just leave more for Guy and Maeve's guests to eat. And Alan has plans for another delicacy. I've got another nice little idea for a party for you. Oh, what's that? How about a Victorian everlasting syllabub? Syllabob. Syllabob. Yeah. What's a what's syllabob? A syllabob? Well, I've got to tell you about that later, but what I do actually need for it is some milk, fresh from a cow. Guy and May visit Colin, the local dairy farmer, and Daisy, who's ready to be milked. Yeah. <laughs> right. So when you milk in the old days, they used to push their heads into the cow. Right. So you could feel when the cow was yeah. going to kick here. Because she'll tense up. You could, you could feel, oh, no, so you the, could feel the, the muscle, the and it gave you a little bit of a warning so you could get out of the way with your bucket. All oh, right. So, so I'm going to put my head in there and just... Put your head down. Oh, she definitely had a curry last night. <laughs> Can you hear her Can you? Yeah. Now get a hand on each teeth and draw <laughs> down as you... <laughs> yeah, right, Daisy. Yeah. I'm sorry about this, love. In the 1800s, an individual would milk 20 cows twice a day, creating 1,700 pints of milk. Stumped him. There's no spanners attached to it. I'm glad I have my coffee black, I see. <laughs> <laughs> That's better. Watch your chief, watch it. But at all times, keep your bucket, because that's your livelihood. In the early days of the canals, narrowboat men had a reputation for illicit milking. Because the times are out, you didn't get a long run for steering your narrowboat. Mm. Sorry, sir. They wouldn't do. They'd go into the fields at night and nick the, nick the milk out of the cows. <laughs> they need you a bit quicker than I was. Yeah, I should think so. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, Maeve is on hand to top up the bucket. And after a quick sample of the freshest milk possible... Ah, good brew, Chief. <laughs> well done, Chief. That's Chief. fairly mega, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The boys are nearly ready to head back to the kitchen. Can I have a bit more? Daisy, please. Please. Mm. What was that, yes or no? I don't know. Back with Alan, the boys start to mix the ingredients for the syllabub. 
a sort of Victorian alcoholic milkshake, which could be eaten cold for breakfast or dessert. It contains sugar, lemon zest, half a cup of cider and brandy, and nutmeg. Victorians enjoyed nutmeg. The, uh, the Victorian ladies apparently used to uh, have a nutmeg in a, in a little silver clasp and like on a chain, and used to wear it around the neck. Apparently used to ward off evil spirits. Ward off evil? Well, there is something here, eh? The milk is added in the traditional style, as if it was coming straight from the cow for maximum froth. Well, how hard do you reckon an udder is? Off. About there, maybe. About, about there. there. We're going to get some splashing on. Gently, gently, gently. What they used to do originally is just scoop off this when it had just left and eat that for breakfast. <clears throat> For breakfast, yeah. They'd have that for breakfast. Put hairs on your chest. It's not bad. Have a bit. What, just scoop it off the top? Yeah, scoop it off the, the top. Right. For breakfast. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know if it's... Um, it's potent. I'll give yeah. you that. You could... Whew, touch, the, touch the window, he says, a little bit. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you what, that'll catch on. I reckon the party will go a treat. Yeah, looking forward to it, boss. Mm. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Enjoy. The reckless relaunch will also need some entertainment. So next up for Guy and Maeve is finding a suitably traditional British game. What we need is something Henry VIII's archers used to have a go at. Used to use for a bit of practice. Darts. In fact, there's an historic form of the game that is unique to the famous old Industrial Revolution cotton town of Manchester. It's called Log End Darts. <laughs> Guy and Maeve track down a local ladies' team who still play this old-fashioned game. We're the same back there, I'm not shy, it's right. Go on, just get going. Don't be shy, don't be shy. Come on, where do you want Stand in the middle there. Right there, yeah. Get you down like that yeah. and look yeah. at a number what you want to throw for. I want to go, go for 20. Do want to go for 20s, right? Throw for 20s, then. Right, anywhere in that 20. Yeah. What about the just, ring up? What about the ring up? It's a bloody board. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I'm used to it. Oh, man overboard. The board is much smaller than usual, has no trebles, and is made from a slice of elm tree. Why is it wet? Why is it wet? Because it has to be so it, it, it dries, it'll just split. Beer was a lot less contaminated than Victorian water, so a trip to the pub could be said to have been good for your health. Pub games like this became increasingly popular. The boys accept the challenge of a doubles match versus Lil and Barbara. We're playing the league champions, match. Are we? We're in the league last year. Oh, wow. 73. Oh. Yay! Yay! Well done, man. Right, Chief, keep him in the board this time. 28 plus 8. 28 plus 8. I can't add up unless I've got my tape measure in me. <laughs> The log end dartboard was often made by Victorian carpenters, looking for an easy way of settling their bar bills. Bev, they only need six, we need over one. Hey. Hey. Just keep. Never, oh, absolutely. No, never no, say no, that. No, 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 no. You never know, Chief. You're easy to do it. <laughs> With less than 50 boards left in existence, these ladies are maintaining a proud link to Manchester's past. It looks like the ladies have won, but Log End Darts has never had a standard set of rules. And a quirk in the complicated scoring system of this league means the lads can still win. If Maeve can just hit the four. No pressure, Maeve, it's no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Bust. The boys lose. Well done, ladies. Well done. Hey, we're down the wire. Hey, well done, Liz. Well done. Hey, could be worse. We didn't get, we didn't get smoke. No, 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 no. <laughs> A good time was had by all. So the boys transport one of the rare boards submerged in water to prevent it from splitting back to Reckless. Ready to provide some old fashioned fun at their end of week event. With the historic log end darts and the nibbles sorted, 
Guy and Maeve start to get reckless ship shape for the big reveal. I love these mugs. We'll have to get these mugs out. Oh, I need to show them off. They put their favourite creations in pride of place. But there's one last skill they need to master so they can record this grand voyage for posterity. To commemorate the end of her adventure on Reckless, we're going to use something that was becoming dead popular in the Victorian age. Dead popular. Photography. Richard Sinan Jones, an expert in Victorian cameras, has braved the sub zero temperatures. All right, boss. Hello. Hopefully, his wonderful contraption will help provide some fitting mementos for Reckless. I mean, he's bagger, isn't he? Yeah, I'm just looking, he's an absolute work of art. I mean, she's proper. And this bit here is a, that is a genuine. The lens is original. Oh, is it? Yeah, that's uh, an 1860s lens. It's, an, awesome it's an original portrait lens from the time. Can we get on um, taking some pictures then? I think we should. Well, well, I'm also awesome. I've got some ideas in my head. Well, well, what I want okay. you doing while well, I'm taking some all pictures. All right, there is a deal. Picture of me and a picture of you. The boys are going to try callotype photography, invented by Brit William Fox Talbot in 1841. It produces a negative, but on a dull day can take a long time to achieve. You do realise that in this light you're going to have to be still for about, I don't know, one or two minutes. That ain't going to happen between me and him. You are, Jeff. Not in a month of somebody's mm. boss. Seriously, we're dead still. I'm not entirely sure that's possible, but we'll, we'll give it a go. Go on, I'm going to get me, I'll get me yeah, back yeah. on here. Jeez. Right. It's oh, 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 Victorian more. photographers developed neck braces hidden from the camera's view so subjects could rest their heads perfectly still. <laughs> Where do you want me looking? At the camera. Look, yeah. Well, no, 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 not at the camera, no, that's not very artistic. Oh, is, oh, is it not? Right? Oh, oh, of course! Some, no, 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 no! This man, Fox Talbot, sorry, Chief, sorry, um, he was really sort of arty about how he took his pictures. Take me out off, Fox. Indeed, Fox Talbot was as keen on the artistry and composition of his photos as he was the chemical process. So Maeve carefully lines his shot up. I hate having my photo taken. I hate it. Then he fine-tunes the focus, which is a little tricky given the lens makes everything appear upside down. Oh, look at that. It's hideous. <laughs> But this is taking a lot of fiddling, and I'll tell you what, this is just driving home to me how difficult it is. Because, you know, we can wander around with the camera going click, 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 that's rubbish, that's rubbish, that's rubbish, or like that one. We ain't got that luxury with this. This has to be set up right before he nods off. Pull your finger out, boy, I'm nithered. Open the ground glass. Like Finally, the film is loaded, which is simply a sheet of paper soaked in silver iodide and kept in a wooden cassette. When light hits the silver, it causes a chemical reaction that will create a negative of whatever the lens is looking at. Has a two minute started yet? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. When he takes this off, <sighs> the exposure will start. Yes. Right, guy. You ready? Because this is for real, Chief. Go on, a lot boss. of preparation. Chop, chop. Two minutes, you say? Yeah. Go. Oh, listen to that silence. Peace and quiet. Six, five, Four, three, two, one. Well done, boy. Well done, Chief. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to find a cup of tea. <clears throat> Once defrosted, it's Guy's turn to take a photo, and he throws himself into it with all the enthusiasm of his Victorian forefathers. Cross your, cross your legs. Cross your legs. In the 1860s, London's Regent Street alone had an amazing 42 photography shops. All right, Richard, what do you reckon? Oh, I want to hold close, I reckon. Someone, you know, like you see on like a Greek statue or something like that. Right, Looking over there, there, isn't it? Over there. The process makes warm colours look dark, so rosy skin tones come out quite black, making Victorians often seem rather ruddy cheeked. They're still nervous. I am still. Focus yeah. on his, his eyes, his face. Yeah, I've got, I've got them, I've got them, I've got them. Yeah, that, that's us, that's us. Right. Are we ready? We're ready. When you're ready with your timepiece. Yes. That's nearly as old as the camera, I think. <laughs> you ready? Winter's come now. One, one two, three, have a bit. Yeah? Look at them, the size of them snowflakes, Maeve. The size of your hand. I want this picture to tell a thousand words. No, Maeve, keep the face straight. Thank you very much. This is good, though. Look at that. This is going to be... Keep the face straight, Mavis. Thank you very much. He's done good, though. He's kept the arm up, hasn't he? I like that. Bit of endurance. And That'll do you, boss. That'll yes. do you. It'd been all right if I hadn't had this constant shelping in my ear off. <laughs> Man alive. 
I wonder if they can keep that gob shut long enough to drink tea. It's now time to develop the negatives, and Reckless is transformed into a floating dark room. The silver in the paper isn't sensitive to red light, so the boys can still work without further affecting the pictures. You know, if we opened this in the daylight, would we ruin all the hard work that we did earlier? You would With all this pausing care for a lot of you. You would indeed. We'd lose everything. First, the boys need to delicately float their paper on acid. There was a lot of work went into this, as with a lot of things we've done on Reckless, and it would be just nice to get it right. The acid will turn the light-affected parts of the silver paper dark, making an image appear. And again. Assuming Guy and Maeve have taken their commemorative calotypes correctly, that is. And we can already see an image start to... Uh, oh, yeah. I think oh. I can see someone pointing. <laughs> Who was putting that pose? The creation of negatives was revolutionary. It meant you could print as many pictures of a scene as you wanted. Previously, if you needed more than one copy of an image, you needed more than one camera side by side. Brilliant. That's good. This was all considered quite magical. Fox Talbot explained, it is the process by which natural objects may be made to delineate themselves without the aid of the artist's pencil. So there you go, guys. Hey, up. He doesn't look happy camper, does he? Hey? He, wa <laughs> he, he wasn't, to be fair, was he? Poor fellow. That's pretty darn good. Yeah, I'm quite pleased with that. There we go. Well done, boss. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I love the ghostly fingers there. Uh, uh, yeah. It, yeah. You'd pay a fortune to try and get that effect now, wouldn't you? You'd pay a fortune. With the negatives made, it's down to Richard to turn them into prints and bring them to the launch event tomorrow to reveal whose picture is best. It's the day of Reckless's official launch, but yet more snow and ice overnight has meant closed roads and people being advised to stay at home. Oh, these here Victorians are right into the garden parties. Mm, mm. Not in six foot of snow, though. No, mate, no. It's uncertain whether anyone will be able to make it, but Maeve lights a beacon to let the world know Reckless is open for business. <laughs> She's completely transformed from the unloved wreck that Guy and Maeve started out with a few weeks ago and is now a fitting tribute to a time when Britain led the world. When we first set off on that boat and we were bashing it into this and bashing it into that, I just thought, mega, this is going to be a trip of a lifetime. Oh, all the inventors learning about it all and how important these steps were that those guys took then and how it's still very current today, what they did puts us where we are today. All right, young man. By the 1900s, all of our superstar engineers, well, they'd all kicked the bucket. We had no one coming through. There was no funding being put into engineering education. And that was disappointing, in a way. You know, other countries are caused up. But 150 years in the engineering limelight, not bad innings, was it? Not really. And this boat was a tribute to that. 150 years. Well done, boys. Is anyone going to turn up? I'm hoping so. I reckon our friends are a hardy bunch, like our Victorian predecessors, and I think they'll battle on through. And sure enough... Morning, guy. Hey, up, boss. One at a time, a handful of hardy souls make it for a look round Reckless. Let me put that down there. This way you're having your party, hey, then. <laughs> Stan, the bedmaker, wants to see the mattress he helped Guy assemble. This is, this is the boudoir. This is my bedroom. All right. So what do you reckon? Here she well, is. It fitted in. Oh, yeah, just, just. We made all the sheets in Arkwright's mill. It was mega. But you can see my stitching. I, I can, see, I can see your stitching. Yeah, yeah, I've got a bit of work to do there. Colin that? helped Guy yes. bake a traditional loaf and has got his eye on the log end darts. As a Lancashire lad, I think I am a little bit familiar with it. Are you I now? think it's a Manchester dot boy. Hey, it doesn't have the trebles yeah, on yeah. it. I think we need a go, don't we? We do. Oh, dear. It's what Henry VIII's archers used to use for practice. Okay. Hey, up. Oh. <laughs> well done, boss. Yeah. <laughs> Alan Chief. I've got Richard with me. Next to arrive is Richard the photographer, with Guy and Maeve's right. prints. Hey, you There you are. Look at that, Chief. Check her out. Hi, oh, yeah, okay. What do you think, Richard? What do you well, think? Well, I like the two, obviously. You know, they're both good compositions, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. But as far as an iconic image goes, I have to award the, uh, the prize of 
best image, I think, to uh, Maeve's image of Guy. <laughs> so we're both a winner in a way, then. Are we both a winner in yes. a way? Yes, we are a winner. Look at that, Kevin. Guy and Maeve's friend Kevin is rather taken by the soap made from animal fat. We've still got hairs in it. I don't want to go on our way to <laughs> <know> his bed. <laughs> While Rob, who showed Guy how to make an alarm clock for Reckless, makes a beeline for Maeve's cake. So what do you reckon, Rob? What's the verdict? What do you reckon? Oh, it's very nice. Yeah? Mm, is that it? Mm. No, I think it's lovely. So what, what goes into Victoria's sponge? Eggs. Really? I rather like this knife. Oh, ah, yeah, we made that in Sheffield. Well, you made this yeah, we made them in Sheffield. Wow, I could perhaps do with a chisel, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you cheeky blighter. Well, go on, Colin. Oh, you're, you're quite right. It tastes a lot better than it looks. <laughs> yes. And the cake is eating quite nicely. Right. That's really nice. Made our own cups at Wedgwood. You yeah. see? Brilliant. Mm, you know, like in the film Ghost? Yeah. Same thing. Not Go quite on. as delicate as I would have expected. <laughs> no! You wouldn't want to drop it on your phone, would you? They're a little bit on the chunky side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've got to have a taste of this. This is everlasting syllable. This, oh. Chief, is potent. Oh, it's lovely. Yeah, that's what I said. Strangely warming, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. It's freezing cold. It's all, all that brandy. Despite the inclement conditions, the day's been a success. Thank you very much, Kev. <laughs> and the boys' <laughs> creations have been met with full approval by the guests. They're beautiful, aren't they? You're cleverer than you look, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that's absolutely brilliant because it's the old skills that we're nowadays losing a, a lot of it. Everything's becoming mechanical, always. Ah, uh, which is right, yeah. Um, yeah. You lose the traditional skills if somebody doesn't keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Everything you've done has been interesting and you've obviously enjoyed oh, it. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks for the cake. <laughs> <laughs> And so, after six weeks, Guy and Maeve's mission on board Reckless is finally over. So, Maeve, we set out trying to squeeze 200 years of British excellence into the boat. Mm. You think we did it? Oh, yeah, it's been a fantastic journey. Yeah? Into the Victorian Industrial Revolution. What a discovery. We've learned some stuff. It's been a pleasure to sail with you, Chief. Well done, Chief. Cheers. Cheers. What do you fancy next? Train. A train? 